Madam, please, you can please join us. Let us begin our program with a Vedic invocation for a long, healthy and independent life for all of us. Om Tachakshur Deva Hitam Purasta Chukra Muchara Pashyema Sharadaha Shatam Jeevema Sharadaha Shatam Shinuyama Sharadaha Shatam Rapravam Sharada Hashatam Adina Syam Sharada Hashatam Who Yasha Sharada Hashata O Shanti Shanti Shanti. A very good morning to all of you. Sapo Namaste Abhivadan Namaskar. I would first invite our director. Professor Nageshwar Raoji to kindly welcome the distinguished guests, audience and the participants. Professor Nageshwar Raoji. Good morning. First of all, I welcome you all to this conference organized in collaboration with Vivekananda International Foundation and Research and Information System for Developing Countries, New Delhi. Professor Shashi Prabha Kumar, Chairperson, Governing Board of the Institute, Chief Guest and the Distinguished Speaker, Sri Rajesh Ekta, Secretary, Minister Paish, of India, Dr. Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General at RIS, Dr. Arvind Gupta, Director VIF, other distinguished speakers and dignitaries, fellows and, and friends. It's an honor for me to be a part of this conference and welcome you all to this four day conference divided into nine sessions having themes and sub themes 17 experts they are invited to make their presentations and to share their experiences on various issues of Ayurveda. The major sub-themes of the concept are Ayurveda and holistic well-being, Ayurveda for humanity, person-centric, integration of lifestyle, diet in Ayurveda, nature content treatment, Ayurveda and mental well-being, active predictive medicine, well-being of aged persons, women and child health, well-being of herbal and animal world. We see that the aim is holistic and it also concerns our well-being also. Gone are the days when we were talking about only the allopathic medicine, wherein uh, curative aspects 
they are being taken into account. And once the disease has occurred to you, it has affected you, then we go for those doctors go for surgical operations and take but once we are planning our health then the preventive course of action that is going to help us a lot and in this context our traditional wealth in the traditional knowledge in the field of health science that is going to help us a lot even today also, some of us believe that these traditional prescriptions regarding our treatment, they are being treated as subtly modes of eating deprivation. But with the recent enforcement and also understanding of the basics of Ayurveda and also our traditional modes to which the preventive well-being of an individual, it can be taken care of. The entire philosophy, it has been. And that is why the SDG pool talks about universal health coverage. It talks about one earth and one heaven. So that particular theme is attracting all of us. That how the Ayurveda can be integrated to support our preventive action for the well-being. And if you see that most of us believe in the traditional things and we see that it has got a good action also. Yoga, morning walk, they all are the very, very small things which have been practiced traditionally. And most of us are getting the benefits because I'm also a person who believes in some of these basics. The morning walk, this I practiced, I think, 20 years. And the impact of that is that rarely I have a casual leave or any medical leave with respect to health conditions. Same is the story when we follow some of the basic asanas of yoga, you'll find that nothing will happen to you. And there are case histories through which we can learn a lot. And once these case histories, they start talking about the well-being of the humanity, then we are seeing tremendous you come out with the a separate department of Ayurveda, separate ministry of Ayurveda. Ayush is and allied healthcare facilities. They are being provided to lots of people. Even I'm also holding the charge of Indira Gandhi National Open University. We do have health sciences, basically concerned with allied healthcare services. And we are reaching to 70 to 80,000 people in the country as a whole to support those endeavors which the ministry, the Ministry of Ayush, intends to reach to the masses of this country. And all these initiatives which the ministry has taken. They are now to reach to all of us, to the masses, to the humanities. And even internationally also we can reach effectively. And keeping effective in mind, our honorable chairperson has thought of holding a conference wherein the administrators, the government officials, academicians, the doctors, and the people who are in the field of academia. If they join together and prepare a blueprint for action, then we can contribute significantly to achieve the basic of that SDG, which talks about 
the well-being for the world. With this, once again, welcome all the distinguished to this conference, and I convey my sincere best regards to all of you who are contributing significantly in this four-day conference, having eminent speakers from different sectors of the society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Thanks a lot for your welcome address and also all the support that you have rendered for organizing this conference. It's unfortunate that you couldn't be here as many of the distinguished guests and participants who were all very enthusiastic about visiting Indian Institute of Advanced Study Shimla. But nonetheless, we decided to go ahead despite all the extreme weather conditions and we decided to hold it in hybrid mode. I'm thankful to Dr. Gupta, Director VIF, who agreed to this proposal, and then Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, who in the meetings of TF3, where I was made a co-chair, my name was suggested by Dr. Arvind Gupta from the Vivekananda International Foundation. And he always suggested that we should get Ayurveda included in the policy briefs that are being prepared under G20. Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, as chair of T T20, he always inspired us all participants to hold side events, side events for T20 as part of the G20 presidency. And I decided that I should hold some a conference on Ayurveda at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Although Ayurveda is not my special area of study, but being a student of Sanskrit and Indian philosophy, I, as all most of the Indians, we practice Ayurveda, we believe in the principles of Ayurveda. It has been transmitted orally from one generation to other. When I started working on this conference, I requested Dr. P. Ram Manohar Vaidya, who's an expert in this area, to assist me as coordinator and he readily agreed. He brought many minds, many experts in the field for participating in this conference, and their names are listed, and you will be listening to them all in these two days and nine sessions. In Indian tradition, we all know health plays a very, very important role. Four pursuits of human life are enjoined for us, Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. But Ayurveda says, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, Nam, Arogyam, Gula, Muttamam. Nothing can be achieved, not even Artha can be achieved without good health or without Arogya. So Arogya and Dirhayu. All of us aspire for a long life. Whenever we wish on happy birthday, whenever we wish on happy birthday, Happy and long life. Ayurveda is not a science of medicine alone. Ayurveda is a holistic collection of wisdom in which the code of conduct is listed, the mental traits which should be inculcated, they are all listed, and how one can achieve 100 years of full life in good health with strong vigor and with all the aspirations being fulfilled. So with these words as background, I would just say that Ayurveda has twin purposes. It's not only for treating the diseases. Ayurveda says, Swasthasya Swasthya Rakshanam Aturasya Roga Prashamanam. So it's a preventive as well as curative science. While all the other sciences of medicine, they try to cure the disease. And that disease also in part, you see, the Ayurveda is a holistic system. It treats the patient as a whole. So the whole system 
of the patient has to be treated and that treatment comes at a later stage. First, we have to protect the health of a healthy person. So it is for the healthy person as well as for those who have been <laughs> of disease. So swasthasya swasthya rakshanam, for that the daily routine has been prescribed. It is descriptive as well as prescriptive, preventive as well as curative, as I said. And it is holistic in one more sense that it is not only for human beings, it is for the whole world. And in, in this world, we living beings are there, but there are many non-living beings. So four types of living beings and four types of non-living beings, Sthavara and Jangam, they all have been listed. So Ayurveda cares for the trees, the plants, the herbs, the animals, the birds, and the human beings, of course. In this way, Ayurveda is holistic on many counts. And it is a holistic science of not only health, but well-being. Therefore, this is a, in, an inclusive approach of Ayurveda that needs to be adopted in the modern world, which is already which has already had the trauma of COVID and many such diseases. With these words, may I request Dr. P. Ram Manohar Vaidya, Research Director, Amrita School of Ayurveda, Kerala, who is coordinator of the conference, to kindly introduce the theme. Thank you, Shashi Prabha, Madam, uh, for <clears throat> inviting me to present the theme of the conference. First of all, I would like to offer my humble pranams to all the dignitaries who are participating in this event. Professor Nageshwar Rao, Director IIS, Shimla Vaidya Rajesh Kotecha, the Secretary, Ministry of Ayush, Dr. Sachin Chaturvedi, Director General of RIS, Dr. Arvind Gupta, Director of VIF, Professor Shashi Prapa Kumar, Chairperson IA, Shimla, and all the other dignitaries, speakers, and participants of this event. So our theme for this event is Ayurveda, the holistic science of well-being for the world. And today we are facing a global healthcare crisis. The rates of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and other non-communicable diseases, what we call as NCDs, in low and middle income countries are increasing faster in younger people and with worse outcomes than even in wealthier countries. On the other hand, data suggests that medical error is the third most common cause of death in the United States of America. On the one hand, medical science and technology are advancing like never before. On the other hand, chronic illnesses and healthcare expenditures are also on the rise in an appalling manner. So we are facing a paradoxical situation today, and this can be very confusing and put us in a state of complacency because of all the developments technologically that is happening on one side. It's still not helping us to achieve the higher goal of health and well-being. So what is needed today is a paradigm shift. It's not just, you know, fixing up small things. We need a complete paradigm shift in our perception. Like so many emerging infectious diseases, the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to humans arose at the interface between humans, animals, and the natural environment. We have learned a very big lesson from the pandemic. And this is where the concept of one health resides. And in Ayurveda and in our Vedic culture, you know, we believed in the well-being of the whole creation. Tachamyo Ravrini Mehe Asdi Shanti Mantra says, Shamno Astu Dvipade Sham Chatushpade Urdham Jigadu Bheshajam. So all these, uh, the Vedic vision has always looked at the health of the whole, you know, cosmos. So too much effort still goes into products that offer little benefit, while those needed, particularly antimicrobials to combat resistance, attract little investment. So there are wrong priorities. And we must also ask why governments take the most risks funding basic science while pharmaceutical industry reaps the benefits. 
So the problems in our healthcare system include subpar quality and patient safety, a misplaced focus on acute care rather than prevention and population health, inadequate patient centeredness, and unsustainable cost. So if healthcare systems are to evolve, they must shift both operations and leadership out of the hospital into the, you know, the domain of public health and actual life of the people. We need to empower people to create health. So today, this is the situation more than 50% of the world lives with chronic disease. Even in developed countries, 81 million Americans are having multiple chronic conditions. 99% of disease management is actually in the hands of individuals and their families. So it is in this context that we re-examine the holistic model of Ayurveda. And according to Ayurveda, holistic health means an approach to well-being that simultaneously addresses physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual aspects. It is an approach that doesn't fragment the human being into various compartments and segments. We look at the person as a whole. And this is what we call, it's not just curative or preventive, it goes into the domain of what we can call as healing. So healing means actually to make whole make what is broken into a complete, seamlessly connected, undivided whole. That is the meaning of healing. So Ayurveda goes beyond prevention, uh, cure into the domain of healing. And the healing is a process that has to happen continuously because as we live our life, there is fragmentation, there is disintegration. And moment by moment, Ayurveda advises a method of living that can keep us whole and complete. So Ayurveda relies on many components such as religious, spiritual traditions, cultures. It embraces life in its totality. Everything has an impact on health and life. All human activities have an impact on. So Ayurveda is not just interested in the medical aspects, but in the whole aspects of life. That is why Ayurveda came to be known as Ayush, Ayusho Veda or Ayurveda. So the future of the healthcare system lies in the kind of holistic approach professed by Ayurveda, which will embrace modern medical science and technology while preserving the age-old wisdom of a nature-centered approach to healthcare. So this T20 side event on Ayurveda is very relevant. Shashi Prabhaji already mentioned about it, so I'm not giving much details. So this national conference aims to highlight the potential of Ayurveda to nurture holistic health before all the member countries of G20 for their consideration and adoption. It is organized as a side event of the T20 Task Force 3 and aims to present and propagate that Ayurveda is not just a system of medicine, but an integral science of well-being for the whole world, humans, animals, and plants. So we have a galaxy of experts with 17 speakers who will present the multiple facets of holistic, holistic health as propounded in the tradition of Ayurveda. And the goal of this conference is to discover actionable items that can nurture a holistic healthcare approach in the world through the wisdom of Ayurveda. And we are expecting that the speakers will not just talk about the holistic aspects of Ayurveda, but what are the actionable items that we can identify that are relevant today to transform the landscape of global you know, healthcare delivery and how we can create a health culture that is primarily focused on realizing the goals of holistic health, of higher health and well-being. So Ayurveda is also very much inspired by the yogic uh, philosophy, remove the sorrow before it arrives. Heyam Dukkha Managadam. So over, over emphasis on curative medicine has led to neglect of approaches to nurturing positive states of health and wellness, which is emphasized in traditional systems of medicine. So there is a need to nurture healthy lifestyles, diet habits, and home remedies to prevent diseases, which have been part and parcel of traditional healthcare approaches. The rise of NCDs is really alarming. And if you make projections, it's quite impossible to think of, you know, the scale, the magnitude of resources that we need to handle the epidemic of NCDs as it is a looming threat on humanity in the coming decades. Non-communicable diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and respiratory ailments account for around 75% of global morbidity and mortality. 
and such chronic conditions require continuous palliative care and an approach to improve quality of life. So treatment approaches that integrate traditional medical practices can help us to address the burden of NCDs more effectively. So at this point, I would like to give another dimension to holistic health. Ayurveda has defined holistic wealth in multiple ways, and it is not possible to discuss all of them in a short time. But there is a very interesting concept of Ayur Arogya Saukhyam that beautifully synthesized these multiple dimensions of holistic health. So Ayurveda brings a three-dimensional approach by targeting the preservation of life through life-saving medical interventions, which is the preservation of Ayus and promotion of health or Arogya, where the body becomes capable of functioning at a high level of efficiency and at the same time also nurturing well-being, Saukhya. So Ayurveda says a holistic health addresses all these three goals simultaneously. Preservation of Ayus, the promotion of health and nurturing of well-being. And that is why the biggest blessing that was given in Indian culture is Ayur Arugya Saukhya Mastu. So Ayurveda has very deep and profound conceptual background here. Purushoyam Loka Samhita, the human being is an epitome of nature. And without nature being healthy, we cannot be healthy. So we worship nature. Preservation of health included the preservation of the balance in nature. For people of a locality, plants growing there are the best suited. So a local, region-based approach, decentralized approach to healthcare. Purusham Purusham Viksha, the treatment is to be individualized to each patient. And these are some of the basic tenets of Ayurveda reflecting its nature-centered, localized and individualized approach to health care. So here we see holistic health being defined from another perspective. So the key elements of holistic health as envisaged in Ayurveda due to limitations of time and uh, you know the need to be uh, compact, this conference doesn't address all the aspects of but the key elements. So first of all, we will be looking at Ayurveda and what we mean by holistic well-being. And then nature-centered medicine. Today, modern medicine has moved towards person-centric care. That is one big step, but we have to go beyond that. Ayurveda is first and foremost nature-centered and then only person-centered. These priorities are very important. When you say nature-centric, it means that we have to preserve the balance of the nature first and foremost, and also have a regional, localized, you know, sustainable model of healthcare. So, and then comes a person-centric medicine and integration of lifestyle, diet and medicine is very, very important. In Ayurveda, medicine supports lifestyle and diet. In modern medicine, we are beginning to add lifestyle and support to medical interventions. In Ayurveda, it's just the opposite. But new studies are indicating that diseases like diabetes, heart disease, you know, even hypertension, there is this uh, DASH approach, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. The direct trial conducted in Europe demonstrated that it is possible to reverse and put diabetic patients on remission just through diet and lifestyle measures. So this is very, very important today. And another neglected area is mental health. It has been estimated that 83% of the, there is a treatment gap of 83%. People with mental problems are not seeking help. They're not identifying it. And most of the treatments are, you know, pharmacological and, and aims to just control the condition rather than achieve healing. And so here Ayurveda plays a very big role in bringing a new perspective to mental health. And then women and child health. Uh, Ayurveda has one of the earliest specializations in pediatrics and mother and child health through the Kashyapa Samhita. Uh, in modern medicine, this branch even developed only a few centuries ago, but we have an entire textbook and tradition for women and child health. And then comes healthy aging and the well-being of aged persons. We need health span, not just lifespan. While longevity has improved through all these technological interventions, 
more and more people are suffering with morbidities, disabilities in old age, including cognitive impairment. And this is an area which Ayurveda has also a branch called Rasayana or Jara Chikitsa. And then finally, the concept of one health, one earth, uh, the well being of the herbal and animal world. So I think what I conclude here is that Ayurveda has a big role to play in realizing one of the sustainable development goals, SDG3, healthy lives and well-being for the whole world. And Ayurveda is emerging both in two domains. In India, it is traditional medicine. And in outside India, where you know it has been introduced, it is part of complementary and alternative medicine and now complementary and integrative medicine. So Ayurveda is very important to understand, this is the last point I'd like to make, is that Ayurveda can provide a meta framework for holistic health. Today, the world is moving towards holistic health, but we do not have a framework. The treatment approaches that are available and propagating in the world in the name of complementary and alternative medicine are so diverse. And Ayurveda was one of the earliest systems to synthesize pluralistic approaches to healthcare. Charaka says, Vividhani ki shastrani prishajam prataranti loke. A meta framework of Yukti Vipashraya, Deva Vipashraya and Satvavajaya approaches to healing covers all the types of healing that are today, you know, propagated in the name of complementary and alternative medicine. So all domains of complementary and alternative medicine, including the philosophy of modern medicine, are represented by Ayurveda. Biologically based therapies, mind-body medicine, energy medicine, body-based manipulative methods, Whole, and Ayurveda is also now recognized as a whole medical system because of its comprehensiveness. So with these words, I would like to welcome all the participants, speakers, everybody to two days of intense deliberation of how we can rediscover Ayurveda as an approach to holistic health that can transform, you know, the delivery of health care. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram Manoharji, for highlighting the essential aspects of Ayurveda. If we go and find what is the WHO definition of health, we would just see health is defined as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely absence of disease or infirmity. So this definition of WHO is also quite comprehensive, but it leaves one or two aspects which are covered in Ayurveda. And basically, if I give you the definition of a healthy person, according to Ayurveda, samadoshaha samagnishcha samadhatu malakriyaha prasannatmendriya manaha swasthaditya bhidhiyate. Atma, indriya and mana. So not only body, mind, as well as all the physical aspects of human being, but most importantly, Atma. There is a spiritual level to it, which has been added in Ayurveda. So it is a very, very integrative system, right from the Rig Veda. In the Rig Veda, we have an Aushadhi Sukta in the 10th Mandala. And it is not without reason that Ayurveda has been linked to Rig Veda. There are four Vedas and four Upavedas. Ayurveda is an Veda of Rig Veda. And in Ayurveda, we have different aspects, but most important of them is that one has to take care of his body, senses, mind, and spirit. This is the Sharira or body is not only a physical organism for beautification and for external decoration. Sharira Madhyam Khalu Dharma Sadhanam. Body is like a temple. It has to be taken care of because without it, as I said earlier, nothing can be achieved. So this tradition, the Vedic tradition of Ayurveda is very, very significant. And this must be made known to the world at large. Not only because it is of Indian origin, not only because I am a Sanskrit student and this is a branch of learning in, contained in Sanskrit, but because this aims at 
well-being of the whole world, as I said earlier. Friends, we are very lucky to have Shri Dr. Rajesh Kotecha, who is the Secretary, Ministry of Ayur. But he is not just a bureaucrat, he is an Ayurvedic doctor and Secretary of Ministry, Secretary in the Ministry of Ayush in the Government of India since July 2017. He has been the Vice Chancellor of Jamanagar based Gujarat Ayurveda University. He has also worked as the Chief Consultant of Chakrabarni Ayurveda Clinic and Research Center Jaipur. He has backed many laurels and awards, Global Ayurveda Physician Award in 2007, Ayurveda Ratna Award in 2008, and Padmashri Award for Medicine in 2015, to name a few. He has authored many books, which include two books I would mention, Concept of Atattva Vinivesha in Ayurveda, which discusses minor psychiatric disorders within Ayurveda parameters and the other book is which we all must have a beginner's guide to Ayurveda which deals with day-to-day -day life practices to remain healthy. I am very glad to have you here sir and I welcome you on my own behalf on behalf of Indian Institute of Advanced Study Shri Dr. Rajesh Potecha for his inaugural speech. Namaskar, uh, Dr. Sashi Prabha Kumar Ji, Professor Nagir Sarao Ji, Professor Sashi Prabha Kumar Ji, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi Ji, Dr. Arvind Gupta Ji, Dr. P. Ram Manohar Ji, all distinguished participants and experts, my namaskar to you all. It is a great pleasure to address you all on this national conference on Ayurved, the holistic science of for the world of well-being for the world. I sincerely appreciate Indian Institute of Institute for Advanced Studies, Vivekanand International Foundation, and RIS Research and Information System for Developing Countries for jointly organizing this G20 T20 advocacy event. As we all are aware, these institutions play crucial roles in fostering research, policy analysis, and knowledge dissemination in their respective fields. Their contribution their contributions to the academic and intellectual landscape in India are invaluable and highly commendable. Dr. Ramanoharji has explained in detail uh, in, 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 in welcome address, Professor Nagarao also, also mentioned about Ayurved and Sashi Prabhaji also have mentioned about the definition and the perspective of Ayurved. We all know that Ayurved stands as a beacon of ancient wisdom, offering a holistic science of health and well-being. It is not only health and well-being and also curative. So, is a well documented scientific system, scientific system of healthcare equally relevant in modern times? Because of its non severable link with nature and lifestyle, Ayurveda has the capability to deliver quality that is promotive, preventive, rehabilitative, and social. That is community healthcare through a holistic approach. Globally, the COVID-19 pandemic and the epidemiological transition towards increasing rates of NCDs has created a huge turmoil and an existential crisis. With an aging population comes an increasing need for healthcare, including long-term care. To win the disease battles of the 21st century while ensuring the biological integrity of the earth for future generations, that is what we call one earth, one health, 
requires interdisciplinary and cross sectoral approaches to disease prevention treatments surveillance monitoring control and mitigation as well as to environmental con conservations more broadly in this context it is imperative for us to explore the potential of traditional medicines especially ayurveda in providing a holistic health care to all ayurveda has broad spectrum of preventive measures to combat the aging process it has a focus branch called tasai which deals with normal band intermedicinal vocal may i request uh, all of you to mute your mics please निर्मल रश्मि बेता तंदर मैं रिक्वेस्ट कर रहा हूँ यू टू टू प्लीज म्यूट योर माइक सरवाद इट हैज ए फोकस ब्रांच कॉल्ड रसायन व्हिच डील्स प्राइमरली विथ जेरियाटिक प्रॉब्लम्स बट इट इज नॉट ओनली फॉर जेरियाटिक प्रॉब्लम्स इट इज फॉर ऑप्टिमाइजेशन ऑफ हेल्थ और promotion of health and there is a considerable considerable scope to develop a safe and cost effective protocol for promotion of health optimization of health and geriatric care on the basis of rasayana therapy practice of yoga and ayurved lifestyle management dr ram manohar ji has mentioned in detail about non communicable diseases we all know that they have decisively replaced infectious diseases and malnutrition as the dominant cause of death globally they are also the world's main cause of disability and their impact in growing is growing over the time and cities are not worthy not only for for their impact on human health but also because they are, they may impose a high economic burden that could rise substantially over the coming decades here also ayurved with its innate potential could check with ncds we all know that these so many ncds are now we all know that they are reversible if if we work with lifestyle modifications diet and ayurveda intervention it describes way to prevent the risk factors of ncds and manage lifestyle disorders the forms of proper dietary management the advice of dinacharya and ritucharya that is daily and seasonal regimen some detoxification biopurification procedures like panchakarma some medicines and rejuvenation therapies which results in whole dimensional well being the pandemic has accelerated the acceptance of ayush systems for its holistic approach mainly focused on preventive and promotive health care and pandemic has provided actually uh, an opportunity for ayurveda and other ayush sciences to prove that they can help in infectious diseases as well as a result there is a huge demand for the plant based medicines and remedies worldwide and its use have increased multifold over the past years for example the export of medicinal plants and products has grown 32.3% during the year 2020 and 21 the with the growing awareness among people towards natural herbs and traditional medicines in india from 2014 to 2020 there is a safe six times rise or six times growth of the manufacturing sector of ayush industries it was 3 billion dollar some 22000 crore rupee in 2014 based on the cii study and in 2020 based on 2020s data in 21 ris has published the study which says that this this size of the total sector manufacturing sector of ice industry became 18.1 billion dollar that is six time rise 
and has worth projection at the moment it is more than 24 billion dollar so from 3 billion to 24 billion in nine years is very highly exceptional and that is a kind of demand across the globe and within our country like ashwagandha guruchi tulsi uh, etc are known for their immune boosting properties and, and have gained attraction worldwide and upsurge in its use and its sales have grown by more than 400 percent during this period global ashwagandha market is also expected to gain market growth with the CAGR of more than 18 percent in the forecast period of 22 to 29. WHO recognized the significance of traditional remedies in global healthcare system and encourages promotes traditional remedies in national healthcare programs because they are comparatively safe, cost effective, eco-friendly and sustainable. WHO in their strategy of 2014 to 2022-23, now it is extended up to, up to 25. The new policy is being framed with the India is also leading for this new policy. It has recommended mainstreaming of complementary and traditional systems of medicine as an affordable and culturally acceptable way towards achieving universal health coverage. We all know that WHO plays an important role in supporting member states to harness the role of traditional and complementary medicine for health and well-being. In this area, there is a significant achievement has been done from India that WHO has decided to establish Global Center for Traditional Medicine in India. It is now already operational. I would like to mention that until recently, all of the WHO offices, all of the UN offices, not WHO, UN offices, including WHO, UNICEF, and other areas of UN, none of the UN outposts is located in any of the developing country. India is the first where we have this UN ASPO outpost already established in Jamnagar in the form of WHO Global Center for Traditional Medicine. This center reflects the vision that harnessing the potential of traditional medicine and it would be a game changer for health when founded on evidence, innovation and sustainability. The WHO GCTM identify various challenges faced by the countries in regulating, integrating and further positioning traditional medicine in respective countries. I am glad to share that Ministry of Ayush has collaborated with WHO on many fronts, including dev developing benchmark document on training and practice of Ayurveda and Yunani systems, yog and panchakarma. I am happy to share that these benchmark documents are already published and available on WHO platform. Also, uh, Ministry of Ayush has collaborated for introducing a second module in traditional medicine chapter of the International Classification of Diseases, Chapter 11, ICD 11. So, this is how it is significant that the Central Council for Research in Ayurveda Sciences has developed a portal named, named Namaste Portal, where all the morbidity codes of Ayurveda, Siddha, and Yunani terminology is posted. And it is a dual coding where when you read a particular code of a particular disease, you understand the Ayurvedic terminology and morbidity codes with a particular coding, as well as the understanding from the conventional medicine perspective. So if somebody has an inflation, inflammation, it is considered as a shotha and, and it is very well described and codified. This has a great significance because this codified coding system is now uh, the uh, available it's now developed to the beta level and this this beta level is now ready to publish the chapter ICD 11 11 chapter of WHO so i would like to mention here that all of these efforts will bring in a lot of possibility of large scale evidence generation through 
ICT based approaches to integrating it to our hospital management systems and through API sharing. Not only that, the insurance facilitation to Ayurveda and other systems in our country is in, is in it is in primitive condition. So this codification system will help insurance companies also to provide better benefits to our systems. Lastly, I would like to mention a few things before I close. I am aware that my time is over. That it's not only all this scientific evidence generation is happening, but in public health area also, in last few years, there is a great upsurge in and and work is going on in integrating Ayurveda and other Ayush sciences into mainstream public health system. For example, government of India has decided to establish 12,500 health and wellness center based on Ayush. 8,000 is already operational and by 23 December, remaining will be functional. So there is a data which is very impressive that from 1st December, 1st January 2022 to 31st December 2022, the operational 7,000 odd plus health and wellness center of Ayush has served more than 8 crore patients physically visiting their centers and average footfall is more than 50 and in some cases, in some places, it is more than 200. That is the kind of the demand of Ayush sciences into the community. The another thing is about establishing benchmark models of tertiary care hospitals like all our Ayush education institutes have tertiary care hospitals. Dr. Ramanurj is working at Amrita. This is the worth seeing the model how a tertiary care hospital can work and deliver to the community. So such hospitals are average footfall from 1,000 patients to 2,005 patients a day, which is very significant. And these models is also worth looking at to look at the secondary care and tertiary care for our public health delivery system. So there are a lot of such possibilities, and I'm sure that in this deliberation of these different areas of deliberation is mentioned by Raman Overji, we will we are looking for some some logical, some tangible outcome and recommendation from these deliberations of this seminar. I am hoping and looking forward to have more collaboration in future as well as a fruitful deliberation of the event. I hereby declare the formal inauguration of the event. Once again, uh, I congratulate the organizers for the successful conduct of the event. Thank you so much. My Namaskar. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh Bhattacharji, for highlighting various efforts that are being undertaken by the Ministry of Ayush. And I think with the support of the government now, this tradition, this valuable tradition, will definitely help humanity. And this message will reach masses. It's already reaching, but it will ex expand more and more with the support of the scholars present here, with the dignitaries present here, and especially with the support of the government. And yourself being at the helm of affairs in the Ministry of Ayush, you are not only presenting it theoretically, but you are also a participant in the practical. You have been a participant. You have been a student of Ayurveda. You have been a teacher of Ayurveda. So I think not only Ayurveda, other entities of Ayush, they will also flourish with it because this is all for the betterment of humanity, for the well-being of society. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your support and cooperation in future. With these words, now I invite our two guests of honor are there, and both of them are in fact the motivators for holding this conference. I invite Professor Sachin Chaturvedi ji, who is currently Director General at the Research Institute in Information Systems. For developing countries, are please please my request, please.
all the participants who have joined in, kindly mute your mics. Professor Chaturvedi has persistently endeavored to build up institutions and launch networks both at the national and international levels. He is credited with the launch of network of Southern Think Tanks and Forum for Indian Development Cooperation, FIDC. He has also created Delhi Process, a major forum for exchange of ideas on South-South and Triangular Cooperation. He has authored and edited more than 22 books, apart from contributing several chapters in the edited volumes. He is on the editorial board of several journals, including the South Asian Economic Journal, IDS Bulletin, Sussex, UK, among others. His book, The Logic of Sharing, Indian Approach, has been a Nationally, the is one of the international developmental corporation. Professor Chaturvedi was also the Global Justice Fellow at the Macmillan Center for International Affairs at Yale University and has served as a visiting professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, was a developing country fellow at the University of Amsterdam visiting fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, in 2003. We are very glad to know that, Professor Chaturvedi. Wish you were here. And visiting scholar at the German Development Institute in 2007. Currently, Professor Chaturvedi is also Vice Chairman, Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Good Governance and Policy Analysis, and ex officio vice chairman of Madhya Pradesh State Policy and Planning Commission. He is also independent director on the board of Reserve Bank of India. He is holding these subsidiary advisory positions in an honorary capacity. And last but not the least, he is chairing the TF3, Task Force 3 of T20. He is also a member of the core committee of G20. And this task for three, which has as its theme, life, lifestyle, resilience, and values for well-being. It is in the meetings of task force three that he was always inspiring all of us co-chairs to organize side events. And it is from there that the idea of holding a conference on Ayurveda, Ayurveda was suggested by Dr. Arvind Gupta, by the way, but both of them are the motivators for this conference. I invite you, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, for your special address, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, 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 Professor Shashi Prabhakumarji, uh, with your uh, uh, support and with your guidance. That work of the Task Force 3 has moved on uh, extremely well and has contributed immensely in terms of how we look at uh, the whole dimension uh, of issues that are of uh, great significance. Uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta, Director uh, Vivekananda uh, Foundation, uh, very dear friend and very respected uh, 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 Kotija ji, uh, who has been uh, inspiring and motivating the work on Ayush and connecting Ayush economy, Ayush international uh, influence, and also trying to shape the larger uh, and there was for bringing in more uh, application of modern technologies to IU sector. We already heard uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Ramanoharji, uh, um, uh, who is coordinating this conference, and the most inspiring address today by the Vice Chancellor of IGNO, uh, Professor Nageshwar Rao. Friends and colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be back at uh, uh, in the Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, though in a virtual form. But I look forward to coming back in person. Uh, it's a great place, and I must congratulate uh, uh, Professor Shashi Prabhakumarji for her leadership at the Institute and bringing back the credence, the objectivity, and uh, the purposeful outcomes that are most uh, uh, suited uh, from a place like this. Uh, I uh, very fondly recall the paper that I did at IIS uh, back in 2003. 
which was about intellectual property rights and access to uh, biodiversity. Now, uh, my, our friends and colleagues, as you heard, uh, this is a side event, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, with the task force uh, uh, three uh, of the Think 20. Those of you who are uh, uh, following the process uh, of G20 uh, would be surely aware of the fact that G20 works on two tracks. One is finance track, which is led by the finance minister, and it uh, it focuses on issues which are pure monetary in nature, which are decided upon by Ministry of Finance and the relevant agencies, including the central bank, that is the Reserve Bank of India. So RBI and Ministry of Finance lead the finance track. And this was the genesis of G20 uh, if we go back in 1997 when the financial crisis happened in Southeast Asia. The issue came up uh, in terms of uh, bringing countries together which are vulnerable and most of the ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, they were adversely affected with the collapse of financial bubble uh, in 1997. And as a result, in 1999, a framework came up of G20 finance ministers and central bank governors. But when the crisis happened uh, uh, across the Atlantic in the United States with collapse of Lehman Brothers, it was thought that finance minister's platform is not sufficient. We need uh, to scale it up. And uh, in, in 2009, it was scaled up to have heads of states in this. And the uh, first uh, uh, G20 summit happened uh, uh, in 2009 uh, with prime ministers and presidents participating apart from finance ministers joining. But in 2010, when the presidency went to two countries, one was South Korea and the other was Canada. And at that point, it was realized that curing finance is not going to save the world. Finance is uh, an outcome of the larger development challenges. So we need to address development challenges upfront rather than curing what of, uh, of the larger uh, ailing system of the global uh, financial and economic uh, uh, framework. And this was the times during South Korean presidency that the second track was introduced, which was called as Sherpa track. As you may be aware, at this point, Mr. Amitabh Kant is Sherpa for Indian G20 presidency. The Sherpa track also evolved on two tracks. One was the official track, which is called as the working group track, where all the government departments come together and discuss issues uh, which are of key significance. Uh, but uh, the other track came up, which is about people-to-people -people, uh, cooperation. And in 2010, fortunately, I was part of the South Korean presidency's team that recommended bringing some of the academics together. And some of us met in the uh, uh, Mexican uh, uh, presidency uh, where uh, we uh, discussed uh, having uh, a group of think tanks, research institutions coming together uh, to have what is called as Think 20, T20, uh, when in the uh, 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 G20, it, it came up. During India's uh, G20 presidency, we hosted 11 uh, working groups. We added one uh, engagement group, and the number has now reached to 12. Think 20, T20 is one of the engagement groups out of those 12. The new addition that India has made is about the startup the uh, um, uh, Startup 20, um, uh, which is being led by Atal Innovation Lab and others. So this is the brief uh, context of this meeting uh, where we are uh, all together. I must also tell you that uh, uh, during the Indian uh, G20 presidency, particularly our leadership with uh, T20, Think 20, we have tried uh, to unbundle uh, 
uh, the larger challenges and and repeat uh, uh, and widen the challenge that was there in 2010 when South Korea addressed and uh, brought in uh, public participation participation of people uh, in this process. What we have tried to do is to open up uh, the uh, T20 process, Think 20 process, and take it out from uh, uh, from uh, 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 the professional uh, dominance of economists. And uh, and I'm myself being from that tribe, but I very strongly feel that economists have uh, not all answers for all problems. And unfortunately, the narrative that has emerged uh, uh, from uh, my own profession and from G20 is that economists know everything and they can answer everything. Uh, it is for the first time in the G20's uh, uh, history of T20 that the process has been opened up and the task force three uh, is the first task force in the history uh, of G20 summits and in the history of T20 where we have opened it up for philosophers, we have opened it up for sociologists, for anthropologists, and task force three is the only task force which has very eminent co-chairs, uh, including uh, uh, our chairperson of uh, IIAS, uh, uh, Professor Shashi Prabha Kumar, who have been bringing in the idea of philosophy, the idea of uh, uh, solutions to global problems. And what she uh, a while ago mentioned, uh, I think, uh, holds the key for our success. And that is the idea of uh, uh, a holistic approach to our life. And I think economic challenges financial or otherwise can only be addressed if we have a holistic approach to life something that uh, indian philosophy always stood for and that i think uh, is something which is uh, which is important uh, from from several perspectives the task force 3 let me also spend a minute on this uh, is uh, focusing uh, is 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 I think you can just mute everyone else uh, and, uh, and, and you can go forward. So, uh, so Task Force 3 is, uh, uh, is an effort to bring forward uh, the challenges that the economy faces. And here we are focusing on four broad issues. First and foremost is the idea of uh, lifestyle for environment or lifestyle for sustainable development as it is being called now. This is largely in terms of uh, uh, addressing the challenges of climate change without demanding technology or money. Whenever uh, developing countries have uh, participated in global challenges, they have always demanded money uh, for uh, coping up with climate uh, challenges that are there or technology from the north. It was after a long that when Prime Minister uh, Modi participated in the uh, uh, COP26, uh, Prime Minister gave an idea in terms of how we can shape. And this is something which was due for very long. And we should uh, appreciate that uh, most of the southern uh, countries, uh, the global south, has been reactionary to the global uh, proposals and not proactively placing proposals on the table. It is for the first time that at COP26, Prime Minister made a proactive proposal on the table in terms of uh, individual responsibility for climate change, institutional responsibility for climate change, and that is in terms of correcting our own course of action. So the lifestyle for environment or lifestyle for sustainable development is a commitment of that. And I, I am so glad that today's conference focuses on holistic science and, and presents it in, in that perspective. So this idea of bringing forward the uh, concept of individual responsibility is very much the core of the task force three of the T20. So life is our first uh, focus area. The second focus area is, uh, is ethics. And this is something uh, which is uh, long forgotten in the realm of finance and, uh, and the way we look at technology. Uh, this task force has raised the issue of connecting ethics with finance. The idea of access, equity, and inclusion, which are important for uh, 
financial inclusion at the global level, at the national level, at the subnational level, at the district level. You have to bring in uh, a financial inclusion with focus on ethics. Those who are uh, uh, amassing uh, huge strengths in terms of uh, uh, financial muscle also have the responsibility uh, in terms of allowing access of those who need it. And this is something that the regional development banks, the IFIs, international financial institutions, have to deliver. And from that perspective, our task force three has raised this issue of ethics in the context of finance. We have also raised it in context of particularly two technologies, uh, uh, are the artificial intelligence, AI-related ethics, what is the responsible research and innovation, but also uh, in terms of genomics and, and, and genetic modification, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the uh, realm of uh, uh, human genetics. Uh, after the completion of human genomic project in 2003, the challenges have multiplied for us. As some of you might be aware, China has produced two twin babies uh, uh, out of uh, uh, genetic modification. And this uh, 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 sort of uh, reordering of the uh, uh, genetic makeup uh, is leading to, and these girls now are two and a half years old, and they are now uh, immune uh, from uh, having cold or jaundice or uh, uh, two other diseases. So four diseases they are resistant to. In their life, they would never get cough, cold, jaundice, and, uh, and two other diseases. So this kind of uh, uh, playing uh, with, uh, with nature, playing with uh, human beings, and creating such uh, 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 living organisms, be that in form of human beings, or uh, two other, the fogo fish, which was uh, earlier genetically modified, is something where countries like India, who are resistant to having uh, Bt cotton, Bt brinjal, and many others where we are uh, even not allowing plants to be played with the technology has gone ahead to play with uh, human beings so instead of a holistic approach we are destroying the ethical frameworks which are important so that's the second area of focus of the task force three and we have made recommendations in the bhopal conference uh, we discussed and the bhopal declaration is absolutely clear in terms of how ethics for technology ethics for finance are important the third and and very important area uh, of the task force three is about well-being well-being uh, in terms of uh, uh, what uh, uh, we heard uh, uh, um, uh, captured very well by uh, uh, Dr. Ramanor Vaidiji and also by uh, uh, our uh, chairperson, Professor uh, Shashi Prabhupada as to what well-being means. Uh, uh, Kote ji has also explained. Uh, for us and being an economist, uh, our idea is how do we measure well-being? And, and we have given a call uh, with uh, uh, several other countries uh, to, uh, uh, to bring in well-being in place of uh, the gross domestic product GDP. So the measurement of economic progress should not be reflected by GDP alone. It should be reflected by well-being index. And we have proposed that well-being index should include uh, uh, what uh, we are focusing today uh, in terms of a country's stock of biodiversity. If a country is depleting biological resources, the quantum of GDP should go down. If you are losing your forest cover, that should go down. If you are having a um, uh, lack of access to pure water, your uh, uh, well-being should go down. And you should also have clean air, access to clean air. So once you bring in these, uh, that's very much about the uh, uh, holistic well-being. It is very much about human-centric development, but at the same time, time we also need interspecies balance because in the world is not just for human beings it's for everyone so the idea of one world the idea of uh, uh, access to health including that of animals is something uh, that is important had that been part of our development strategy wuhan would not have happened covid could have been avoided so since we are 
too human centric now and too much uh, 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 focused on the well being and betterment of human beings and uh, even at the cost of others the ecosystem uh, is becoming more and more fragile and and uh, challenged and from that perspective integration of lifestyle the diets the uh, uh, access to uh, uh, nature centered treatment or or even mental well being uh, 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 the issues that are uh, important for uh, for preventive medicine etc which are focus areas of uh, today's conference i think are are uh, uh, extremely important as i uh, uh, close i would very much uh, uh, like to mention two things which uh, you may like to give as a call uh, from this conference one is the one health approach which i think is extremely important and second is to have a g20 forum on traditional medicine and i think uh, 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 professor shri prabhak kumar ji you may like to consider this as as a recommendation of this meeting that we should create a new forum uh, in the g20 process which should focus on traditional medicine several african countries and with the leadership of the prime minister for the first time africa would have a place on the table yesterday's uh, sherpa meeting has endorsed in hampi uh, uh, what prime minister proposed uh, to have not g20 but g21 to have african union on the table and have g21 uh, so it is a uh, uh, um, uh, very very uh, pertinent here to say that for african countries for several asian countries which have long tradition of uh, plant based medicine system which has evolved with the traditional medicines and their strength of traditional knowledge i think it is timely for us to give a call for establishing and launching g20 forum on traditional medicine uh, which should take ayush and all traditional medicines of all countries together and allopathy which has emerged as uh, 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 a panacea for all of our global problems should do away with that because it's not just homeopathy or uh, or uh, or ayurveda it is all uh, traditional medicine systems of all countries and i think uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, we can have allopathy as a solution uh, it has also brought in several uh, deviations because of the large monopolies that pharmaceutical companies have uh, amassed in terms of uh, creating challenges for the global health system and its management i would stop here and uh, and once again in congratulate uh, iias uh, for the leadership vif for their active role and uh, um, uh, ayush ministry uh, for uh, very generous support that they have extended uh, from ris uh, and from my own team uh, with uh, uh, my thanks to my team namrata and others uh, uh, who have uh, played uh, an important role in terms of uh, evolving this conference so i thank everyone uh, thank you Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi, for outlining the Task Force Three viewpoint and also suggesting that we should go prepare a draft for including one earth, one health, and all the traditional medicine systems of the G20 countries. I must acknowledge here that Professor Chaturvedi was not only instrumental in motivating us for holding a side event. But when we decided to hold it, he extended the financial support. He is a man of economics, as he himself explained. And without economic support, nothing can be accomplished. So he extended full support for paying the travel allowance to all our participants, which was paid. Tickets were purchased, but God had something else in his mind, so we couldn't invite. They, these persons couldn't reach here. But our RIS supported us with open hands, and I must acknowledge with thanks. Thank you so much for all your support and for your enlightening lecture in which you presented a world perspective of what is going on in G20 earlier, because you have been a part of it, and G20 India presidency, for which the logo has been set, one earth, one family, one future. To this, we can add one earth and one health. So health is the prime concern of humanity, especially in today's times. And we are very, very grateful to all the participants who have made it possible to organize this event. Now I invite 
Dr. Arvind Gupta, who is the director of Vivekananda International Foundation, New Delhi. He was the Deputy National Security Advisor and Secretary, National Security Council, Government of India, during 2014 and 17. Earlier, he was Director General of the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, Ministry of Defense, New Delhi, during 2012 and 14, and a former career diplomat. He has served in the Ministry of External Affairs and Indian Missions Abroad. He speaks regularly at the various Indian universities, military, paramilitary, police, and diplomatic academies on foreign policy and national security issues. He has guided research students at premier educational institutions. He is a member of the Board of Studies at the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University and has honorary academic positions at Punjab University and Andhra University. Author of five books, his last book, Opportunity for India in a Changing World, was published by KW Publishers in 2021. His book, How India Manages Its National Security, was published by Penguin in 2018. In 2020, Sage India published a credited volume with Anil Vadhava titled India's Foreign Policy Surviving in a Turbulent World. He has also co edited with Arpita Mitra a volume titled Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam The Relevance of India's Ancient Thinking to Contemporary Strategic Reality. And this is the conference where I happened to visit BIF and the introduction turned into a good collaboration. Dr. Gupta has always been interested in ancient Indian wisdom. Although he comes from a totally different background, but his dedication to the ancient Indian wisdom, he organizes several talks, lectures. I myself delivered a few lectures at BIF, and I now invite Dr. Arvind Gupta for his address, please. Dr. Gupta. Namaskar, Dr. Shashi Bravaji, thank you for that uh, uh, introduction. And uh, also, uh, my congratulations for organizing this very important national conference uh, about uh, which you have been a passionate advocate. And I think uh, all the credit uh, goes to you that you could uh, uh, motivate so many of uh, those who are here to come together. It's unfortunate that we can uh, we are not physically present in Shimla, but I think the that doesn't take away from the uh, importance of the, the conference. Uh, this morning we have heard uh, some uh, uh, prominent experts, uh, including yourself, uh, on different dimensions of uh, Ayurveda, and uh, we have also heard from uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Rao and uh, uh, Rajesh Kotechaji and uh, uh, Sachin Chaturvedi ji, uh, how Ayurveda and more important Ayush is now becoming or being brought into the mainstream. And I think this conference uh, will uh, strengthen that uh, uh, trend. And that is the purpose of uh, this conference. Now, I know a lot of people have to speak still, and uh, so I'll be brief and not to cover the grounds uh, that have already been covered, and I'll try to make one or two practical suggestions. But before I do that, I must uh, acknowledge uh, uh, that uh, uh, my interest in uh, uh, promoting Ayurveda really came from a, a wonderful lecture which uh, uh, Ram Manohar Ji gave at the VIF. Uh, some uh, uh, months ago, last year, I think, and uh, our uh, scholar Rohit Krishna uh, brought him there, and I heard him uh, with rapt attention. And uh, he later on followed it up with a, a, a very good uh, concept note, how Ayurveda can power the development of a global health culture. And this was around the time when uh, G20 was uh, 
kind of uh, taking shape and I think it was still uh, with Indonesia and when uh, in last November it came to India. So the thought occurred to us uh, that uh, in BIF where we uh, emphasize a civilizational approach to building India's narratives in various fields, uh, why not look at uh, this fantastic uh, uh, system uh, which uh, in Ramanurji's world is a, a meta framework uh, which can bring together uh, so many uh, different approaches. Uh, so I think uh, I also discussed it with uh, several people and fairly early uh, in the uh, process in the Indian uh, presidency, uh, we have uh, 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 Ramanurji's advice and some discussions. We came to one suggestion, and uh, which uh, I am glad uh, Sachin Chaturvedi has also articulated uh, just a little while ago. And that was that uh, Ayurveda or holistic health should not remain just as a task force of an engagement group of a G20. Uh, but it should become mainstream. And as uh, Sachinji has said, that there should be a G20 forum. Uh, I wrote a letter to uh, Sherpa, I think uh, that was almost about six months ago. Uh, and I spoke to him also. And where uh, we suggested, and I just read out uh, three or four lines uh, uh, just to uh, you know, uh, consolidate the uh, specific recommendation. Uh, recognizing that alternative health approaches can play a significant role in the fulfillment of sustainable development goal three about ensuring healthy lives and well-being for all ages. The G20 has decided to set up a working group on holistic health to come up with recommendations on how holistic health can be promoted. So I think uh, the outcome of these G20 discussions in uh, Task Force 3 and uh, the side event and wherever else we are discussing these issues should be that uh, in the outcome document of G20, the main document, uh, this uh, idea of setting up a separate uh, and uh, a track on the holistic health uh, should uh, be there and in which Ayurveda should be prominently mentioned in some form or the other. If you do that, then it will be taken note of by the whole world because it will be there in the G20 uh, recommendation or G20 outcome document. If we don't do that, supposing we are unable to do that, then I'm afraid there's so many engagement groups, so many task forces, hundreds of people who are uh, uh, participating and it has happened in the earlier uh, presidencies also, but it will be forgotten. It will remain only a matter of debate and discussion among the scholars, experts, etc. But for it to become a actionable point, it must come into the outcome document of the G20. So my suggestion to uh, uh, the so, team, so, uh, Mute, <laughs> Sorry for the interruption, Dr. Gupta. Sorry for the interruption. I think he has been muted. There are more than 180 participants who have joined it. So it was difficult to identify. I think he has new him. You may please continue now. 
Yeah. Yes. Is it, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yes. Okay. My second recommendation is that uh, uh, it's flowing from uh, recognition of uh, yoga as an uh, international uh, day in the UN calendar. I think something similar should be done uh, uh, in case of Ayurveda or uh, holistic uh, health approaches, etc. If we get a, uh, a mention in G20 outcome document, then perhaps it will be easier to get the UN to declare one of the days as a day of holistic health and with the mention of Ayurveda. Once you do that, then I think uh, you get a global uh, uh, recognition for holistic health. So that's my second recommendation. And I think with the uh, Africa now uh, probably joining uh, the uh, G20 uh, Africa unit joining. And uh, so we can probably start doing uh, some kind of a parvi there also, some uh, engagement with the African countries because they're also quite strong in uh, this area. My third recommendation uh, is that, uh, you know, Ghana is not enough. Talking is not enough. We have to do some. A solid uh, work, and I think I was very happy to hear Koteja is telling us about some specific uh, uh, decisions and steps that have been taken by the Ayush Ministry. And I must say, Ayush Ministry has done a great job and uh, done us proud. But I think this work needs to be continued. For instance, we could perhaps do a conference in which we could invite the allopathic uh, experts, and doctors, and Ayurveda and a series of conferences perhaps to talk about where uh, they can work together. See, unless I, allopathy is so huge, so big, and compared to other systems that, uh, you know, there is an asymmetry here. And this asymmetry can be broken only if we start talking and engaging all uh, uh, medicinal systems, but particularly the Ayurveda, because you talk to the Ayurveda doctors, uh, some of them, of course, are beginning to now take note of uh, holistic health, etc. But most of them, because of their training and professionalism, etc., will say, Dekhi, humko ye nahi hai, because this doesn't fall into this. But uh, uh, I think we should uh, get uh, uh, the allopathic people, along with perhaps the patients also, and uh, uh, do a series of uh, organized uh, uh, meetings and uh, engagements. That's my and I think one more uh, recommendation which follows from the earlier ones is that there should be an international engagement uh, uh, done in a in a systematic and a time-bound fashion uh, at both the track two, track one point five, and official levels amongst the experts uh, of different countries and uh, getting them together so that we can build up a particular uh, uh, momentum for this. And I think India is not just by just suggesting that we should uh, have a G20 uh, forum on uh, traditional medicine. In this very presidency should announce an initiative with some money thrown into it, saying that India is ready to launch an initiative which it will fund. And could, that could be an international initiative. You see, money is very important. Otherwise, you know, you can have so many initiatives and nobody uh, looks at them because there is no uh, resources there. So I think that is another uh, 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 in G20 this presidency because this G20 presidency will pass on to somebody else and all this momentum will be lost that India has uh, built because they will have their own. Uh, so I think uh, India should come up with some specific initiative with some uh, resources, particularly some money, etc. So that we can carry this uh, forward. Uh, I think I will stop here. There are many other things. Maybe later on uh, during the uh, other sessions, I could make some interventions. But thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for your very positive suggestion, positive and practical suggestions. And we take note we should include this. I must mention that Dr. Gupta offered us the clerical assistance at his office in Delhi. He assigned a research fellow, Rohit Krishnan, because here the office was busy with another workshop, international workshop on Nyaya and the Boy, which concluded only on the 13th, but was to conclude on 14th. 
and we were going to start at 15, so I thought there will be much of confusion. Dr. Gupta came to our rescue. All the correspondence was done at VIF, and I must thank Rohit Krishnan here, who is working with us. He will be preparing the report as well with the guidance and support of Dr. Gupta. Thank you so much. I think we had a very, very positive and fruitful inaugural session. And as they say, well begun is half done. So we, we are thankful to Dr. Professor Nageshwar Raoji, Director of this Institute and Vice Chancellor of ICNU, who presented his welcome address, not only presented, but he also set the tone and temper of the conference by authenticating the Ayurvedic principles and practices through his own example. I'm thankful to Dr. Ram Manoharji for all his support in contacting, identifying the participants and outlining the various themes. You must be seeing now that we follow all the themes, possible themes, which are useful for the humanity today. They have been listed here and accordingly, specialists have been requested to participate. Only two things were left. And as Dr. Sachin Chaturvedi mentioned, that it should not only be human-centric, it should be interspecies as well. So I especially contacted one Vaidya, he's a practicing Vaidya in Delhi, about Ashwayurveda. And he says there are texts on Gajayurveda. So this deals with animals and their treatment. I was aware of the text Vriksha Ayurveda that I assigned to some of my friends and I told her that you have to specifically focus on this aspect. So we have papers on Vriksha Ayurveda, Ashwa Ayurveda, women's and children's health when we were concerned with the health of aged persons. So one of my earlier colleagues, she is working in this area. I requested her and she agreed to participate. And I'm glad to say that more 150 have joined in this link which was circulated and more than 30 have also joined in the Facebook Live. So we are glad that this conference, although being organized virtually, has been able to generate interest among people and I hope many more will be joining in the succeeding sessions. We are especially thankful to Sri Rajesh Kotechari, Secretary Ministry of Ayush for sparing his valuable time and giving this very, very inspiring address and also letting us know what the government is trying to do for spread of Ayush and other aspects of traditional Indian medicine. I am grateful to Professor Sachin Chaturvedi and Dr. Arvind Gupta for all their support officially, unofficially, and in all the meetings of TF3. When I joined in the first meeting, I was very surprised. There are all economists, diplomats, political scientists, and international relation experts, what I will be doing there. But gradually and gradually, as Dr. Chaturvedi himself clarified, this time the focus was on ethics. So ethics for finance, ethics for artificial intelligence and i always whenever i had a chance to participate and intervene i have been saying this and i repeat that g20 india presidency must have some input which are specifically of indian origin and i think this is only a modest attempt in that direction and if we could just suggest and get implemented the suggestions that have been made out by the experts here, we will be more successful. Last but not the least, I must thank the academic resource officer, Sri Premchandli, and his whole team, the distinguished fellows who are present here, all the staff of IIAS for their active cooperation and collaboration to make this event a success. Thank you so much. We break for a cup of tea and we reassemble at 11.15.
नमस्कार वेलकम टू दी फर्स्ट एकेडमिक सेशन ऑफ दिस टू डे नेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन आयुर्वेदा दिस इज दी फर्स्ट सेशन एंड द थीम ऑफ दिस सेशन इज आयुर्वेदा एंड होलिस्टिक वेलबींग देर आर टू स्पीकर्स इन दिस सेशन वन इज डॉक्टर राजीव वासुदेवन who is the director ayurved from bengaluru karnataka and his title is ayurveda and holistic well being rajiv vasudevan ji is an alumnus of the prestigious indian institute of management calcutta and a btech in mechanical engineering from the national institute of technology kalikat he has served as country head Motorola BSG India and SAC CEO Techno Park CEO Nest Technologies and regional manager Godred and Boys EBE Rajiv served on the Kerala LHO board of directors of State Bank of India for 3 years from 2003 to 2005 and on the board of governors of his alma mater NITC for 8 years from 2003 to 2010 rajiv is a founding charter member of tie kerala member of the first technical committee set up by the government of india for formulation of nabh standards for ayurveda hospitals and chairman of the first core group on ayurveda set up at a national level by the confederation of indian industry the apex industry body in 2016 rajiv is responsible for providing overall organizational leadership and to align team efforts with ayurved's strategic vision i welcome you rajiv vasudevan ji on behalf of iias vif ris and on my own behalf I invite you for your presentation on Ayurveda and holistic well-being. You may kindly speak for 30 minutes, and then we can have some question answer for 15 minutes. Rajiv Vasudevan. Namaste, Dr. Shashi Prabha, and uh, my first of all, my uh, apologies. I could not present at my lot of time slot. Uh, I. before i begin and uh, speak on my allotted subject and within the allotted time i wanted to acknowledge uh, the speeches earlier by dr nageshwar rao vaidya rajesh kothecha dr sachin chaturvedi uh, and yourself dr shashi prabha but in addition in particular dr arvind gupta made some very telling points which i you know uh, want to just emphasize are extremely important to the outcomes of these deliberations i would like to contribute Uh, and uh, the 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 speaker uh, preceding me professor ramajay sundar has outlined a lot of important points i will try to ensure that i don't repeat uh, some of the points which are overlapping however i have something else, more to share so with these comments uh, let me look at the the topic for the day we are talking about ayurveda as a holistic science of well being for the world so what would be a holistic science let's just go into the definition because ayurveda often is characterized as a non science by many who don't understand science who don't understand ayurveda so it's important to first of all define the the uh, you know in a systematic way the scientific method and whether this applies to ayurveda and i just want to state here as we'll go through and see that Uh, definition of a problem recognition um, measuring data through observation and experiment and then formulation and testing of hypothesis these three these things completely apply to ayurveda as we can see in some of the examples i give forthwith where does a holistic science come to bearing where is it relevant it is typically for systems where there are complex non linear interactions particularly of the kind which is many to many many causes many effects where the causes uh, the effects in turn become causes so it is not even a linear many to many a one dimensional uh, arrow it is where the it's a multi like the network which was uh, you know posited by dr rama but in a, uh, not exactly in that context but across the body 
between the body or the body system and, and the external. Very key point, latest definitions on emergent reality, where the emergent properties arise at the level of the whole that cannot be predicted by focusing on the reductionist parts alone approach. The fact that, as uh, a commentator said earlier, that some medicines don't work in some contexts. You know? So how do we really look at the larger systemic uh, aspects of a problem or of health? Cause effects that are defined as always true arising from the principle of organization. So by the collective, a certain behavior comes. It is not the sum of the parts, but it is something which is above that through an relate relative working together of multiple parts and very importantly when nature organizes itself how apt it is to look at the way the way we experience health ayurveda of course is completely posited on this holistic science approach and when we look at systems because if you go from here quickly we'll understand why this is relevant and why the topic for the seminar today is extremely relevant to society at large so cohesive groups of interrelated interdependent components and uh, where the causal bond boundaries are defined by structure function and role influenced by context as we go into ayurveda deeply we understand ayurveda is the ultimate systems thinking to apply to the health of any system and the relationships between members acting as a whole when we look at holism right the dimensions can be viewed in two directions from the microcosm to the macrocosm at the cell to individual level cell tissue organ subsystem system systems individual which is absolutely an ayurveda perspective similarly looking at swasthya not just of the individual but at the individual and larger units of the individual which is individual family or organization community society nation world universe so what many millennia back was told yatha pende tatha brahmande is completely characterized by this approach that Ayurveda brings to the table, unified by consciousness, right? So whether it is the individual or society or the universe at large, the cosmic consciousness to individual, this is very relevant. So well-being, uh, again, that word, which has been used loosely, very often uh, in, in general uh, parlance, wellness is equated with well-being. And I'm glad that the word well-being has been used here as the Honorable Prime Minister in the last budget speech also brought in that going beyond wellness to well-being. So it's a thriving positive state of individuals and societies where quality of life is accompanied by the ability of the individual and society to contribute to the world with meaning and purpose. It's measured by resilience level, the capacity building, the capacity for action and the ability to transcend challenges. Are we really looking? So how does Ayurveda come into this whole definition? And December 2021, when WHO defined the Geneva Charter for Wellbeing, you know, this uh, just about 18 months back, it talks about these five principles and how can Ayurveda contribute to this, right? An equitable economy, keeping the preserving the planet, universal health coverage, public policy, digital transformation to strengthen the benefits of in going in that direction. Today, actually, digital transformation is causing a lot of disorder. Can we make it a force of good? And Ayurveda's definition of well-being in this, I will come to in a subsequent slide. So when we look the connection between the microcosm and the ma macrocosm, I just I'm not going to go into this for the uh, for the uh, on account of time limitations. But it's important to realize Ayurveda and yoga, which come from the Sankhya school of philosophy, Indian philosophy, we realize that the individual and the part of the individual, right to the Panchamahabhutas unified to the to the cosmic consciousness it goes through and through from the microcosm to the macrocosm the fact that today when we look at the tree of life ayurveda recognizes that everything in the universe is interconnected and you know medical knowledge is not 200 years old or 100 years old but it is the power of observation and learning over million millions you know millions of years put into a very structured construct set of constructs about you know 600 bc to 1500 bc depending on how we call it the fact that human species is only this old life precedes it so significantly therefore when we look at systems thinking how does ayurveda entail how does ayurveda approach human health the important thing to understand that health is not a static 
static uh, phenomenon. It is a result of uh, multiple factors interacting. My genetic profile or my intrinsic health potential with my diet and lifestyle behaviors at a particular place at a particular time with a certain medical history and with a stage of existing vitiation of my state of health. All of this work together at the body, mind, spirit level to cause a state of health or a deviation thereof, right? So Ayurveda, whatever I'm putting here is completely classical Ayurveda. I've just put it into English, common English. The fact that homeostasis, and it's very important to understand what the, the great uh, French physiologist told only in 1865, Ayurveda would have has defined it many millennia back that the ability of the human being, it, homeostasis is that state of equi equilibrium at the physical and chemical level in, internally in a state of optimal functioning. So the body's innate ability to restore balance. So if you look at a healthy person or healthy society, is it, we have to understand is the ability of that system to restore equilibrium in the face of disequilibrium forces, right? When we look at this, because we talked about well-being for the world, it is important to understand homeostasis within the world and how resilient as a system all these individual units that we are defining are individual society, community, state, and nation, and the world. Therefore, the now coming to the individual level, 600 BC, Shushruta uh, Acharya has defined good health, swasthya, right? And swasthya, swasthya itself means abiding in self or self-abiding a state of internal equilibrium right which is that again that homeostasis and as manifesting in these uh, symptoms the shloka goes as it does that samadosha samagnischa samadhatu malatriya prasanna atma indriya manaha Pro professor shashi prabha also told such a person is a swastha right Look at the fact, consciousness, self-aware, coming right into that. Far before WHO came in, in 1976 to define physical, mental, social, this is 600 BC, a most comprehensive definition of health and well-being. So also in common, con in, in latest study, telling how the epigenome has an impact on aging and disease and longevity. 80% of the pathogenesis in a person contributed not by the genome, but by the epigenome, how the epigenome will, will uh, manifest or will, uh, you know, will express itself. So in that context, we have to understand that lost, and it's very clearly defined, the loss of epigenetic information is due to system entropy, which from an Ayurveda perspective can be clearly correlated to the Vata processes or the, the neurological disorders. When it is in order, you have good neurological functioning, but system disorder can be most commonly equated to Vata and certain other physiological phenomena. So the fact that Ayurveda potentially can lead to reducing the disorder, whether at the individual level or at a society. Uh, some of these concepts have been talked about by uh, Professor uh, Rama Jaisundar, but I just want to touch about the fact that there are concepts where we not only look at the, the a disease in a static level, we look at disease in a dynamic level, what we call the Roga Samprapti, which is the etiopathogenesis, which I'll show, and also characterize the disease in a patient. So we're not stuck at the level of a disease, but we talk disease in a patient, what we call the rogi roga avastha. So it's very important that we don't get stuck on a disease and health. We need to look at it in terms of this unique confluence of the patient and the set of diseases. Disease is not a diagnosis. It is a bunch of lack of ease in a human being. All of this coming together, we may call it in Ayurveda as the Bikritis, you know, the deviation from Prakriti, which is the natural integral state from that to a deviated state. So the unique combination, how we are able to look at it and treat it in the context of Kala, Bala, all of this, some of this has been touched upon, so I won't repeat it. The fact that the same sign can come in many diseases, or there could be a unique sign. There could be one disease with many signs, many diseases with many signs. When you look at this type of complex, a very reductionist approach where I am completely focused on just the symptom, 
I may miss completely the root cause. Ayurveda allows this in a way so that through tarka, very systematic process of pr the pramana, pratyaksha, anumana, atopadesha, yukti. So before I go to a, a logical inferential, when I go to a process of putting together data, I am required to go through recording systematically the assess my clinical assessments, in infer from that in the context of whatever is published knowledge, which in Ayurveda would be the Shastras and contemporary medical knowledge, and then leading, putting this all together to a medical uh, prescription, which is personalized in terms of diet, lifestyle, medicine, counseling, state of mind, and therapy. All of this is classical Ayurveda going back to its very origin. So if I were to look at the ultimate personalized health management system, it's Ayurveda Chikitsa. Very often, I would also urge we have these stereotypes that, you know, Ayurveda is so preventive care, not, it's of course, there for preventive care. It's very much there for curative care and then promotive care. The other part is that we often think it is only medicines Ayurveda is. Ayurveda is this full composite of personalized prescription, all of these. And it's the important piece here is that Shuddha Chikitsa, as opposed to causing side effects, Ayurveda, through its very systematic approach to symptom alleviation and disease reversal, which we call Samprapti Vighatan, which is etiopathogenesis reversal, prevents relapse. And if it is done systematically, scientifically, there will be no new disease cause, no side effects, no aggravation of comorbidities. So this type of classical approach was there in Ayurveda all along. Imagine if I take this and apply it to a community or society where one intervention provides, create some good, and then I create disorder at another level, right? So when I look at the life cycle, Ayurveda allows us to extend longevity if I empower people through Ayurveda. So this inevitable cycle of birth to death, can I extend it and also maximize the potential, life potential of that individual, the citizen of society, right? So Ayurveda, the Dhinacharya, Ritucharya, and then, of course, the entire topic of Jara Chikitsa, Rasayana Chikitsa. So as I come into old age, I'm able to create one more curve up so that I again maximize the physical, mental potential of the individual. Contemporary, you know, uh, contemporary uh, approaches such as metabolism, inflammation, etc., are completely are completely captured also similarly in Ayurveda. So whether I take the aspects of metabolism and inflammation in terms of Agni status and Ama status, this becomes very uh, easily translatable into Ayurveda. And the fact is Ayurveda works very beautifully with simple herbal medicines where it is early deviation only with diet and lifestyle changes to reverse these type of pathogenesis processes. When I look at healthcare, very often, the issue is that I'm looking at it from an integrative healthcare. I should look at it from a preventive healthcare lens, which is basically I not just look from this acute emergency care where only 33% of healthcare demand lies today, right? Two thirds precedes it and succeeds it. So Ayurveda is very well placed in this entire orange area and to complement acute emergency care here. When we look at primal prevention, today we have a large population of mother, you know, children being born underweight and you know with deficient growth. How do we ensure that through our country's 1.3 billion people population? Uh, hello. Pongo Nil. So the the thing which is happening is that primal prevention. The, how do I look at the health of an expectant mother so that the fetus yet to be child, yet to be born, maximizes health? So Ayurveda completely covers that. Primary prevention beyond just doing, you know, mosquito and water purity, mosquito uh, bite prevention. How do we, Ayurveda can come in with the oldest simple principles of Swastavritta, right? And how to avoid these uh, pandemics. The, so the preventive lens allows us a new vocabulary going beyond the acute emergency unidimensional approach to healthcare. And I'm not going to take time to explain this lens, but 
we often get caught here. There is a complete stages of healthcare where I'm look, going beyond symptom alleviation to root cause disease reversal, identifying latent health risks before they manifest, right? And going beyond disease to positive health. So the fact that today for mainstream diseases, Ayurveda is already there in the health system of India. If we are able to scale up as the current government is so completely committed to mainstreaming Ayurveda, yoga, and other systems of Ayush medicine and health, we need to realize India has got a Brahmastra to take not just the, its prowess in modern medicine, but to take its prowess in Ayurveda and yoga to offer a unified system which will attract people from across the world to India and also give a better quality of life at an affordable cost and culturally that is acceptable to the people of India. Two more slides on the scheme part. Today we know that the public health scenario, we can't just take things in isolation and talk. That's why in the, con in the context of the previous slide, I would like to tell, today we have an uncovered middle of 150 to 180 million people who are not covered by any payer scheme. The Ayushman, Pradhan, Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Yojana, Jana Arogya Yojana, covers 500 million, but many people are not fully aware of it. Progressively, that will increase. 64 to 47, the latest report from Niti Aayog says 47% of the Indian population still pays out of pocket. Some years back to 64%, which means you've got a long way to go, right? And unless we figure out a way to tackle the issues here, we are not going to be able to to solve India's health problems as also of many of the developing countries. Not to speak of the very developed G20 nations, which are struggling with a healthcare budget, which is unsustainable and still not delivering good health outcomes. So India has the potential to lead the way. And which is why when you look at a public health care ecosystem from a wellness center, our uh, esteemed uh, Ayush Secretary Vaidya Rajesh Koteja talked about 7,500 wellness centers which are already in place for Ayush. How uh, not only these, the 1,50,000 wellness centers which are there from the government of India, how these can be actually used to achieve this thing, which is a uh, triaging and then a local solution for which is protocol driven completely and then which looks at well-being at a village unit level. Where required through the triaging, it is escalated to higher level centers for secondary and tertiary management. This is completely manageable in the emerging Ayushman Bharat digital mission uh, framework as also the Ayush grid. It requires imagination and India as it has led in the area of UPI with its UHI, Unified Health uh, uh, Identifier Framework, right? That entire ecosystem, digital ecosystem can lead the world in again demonstrating just as it did in the pay payment uh, framework in health, how we can use digital platforms for transformation. I want to quickly talk about the fact 50% of the people today have multiple comorbidities. So rather than look again at a unidimensional and treating arthritis or cholesterol or diabetes, we have to realize that in the US, the most developed nation of the world, 76% of the medical insurance bill is, is to be borne is borne by people who have five or more chronic diseases. India is the diabetes capital of the world now, right? I think it's overtaken China. We are in a situation that the diabetic patient has multiple comorbidities, right? So we can't take a very blinkered view of what healthcare is, what is holistic healthcare. The moment we talk about holistic healthcare, we have to look at whole person health. So I'm just trying to give the different dimensions. And the fact that in a whole person dimension, this is how Ayurveda approaches, right? A severe diabetic, what are the, the etiologies, diet, lifestyle, external factors, mental factors, and comorbidities leading to this disease tree? And what Ayurveda posits is you reverse the pathogenesis. So I want to show you this now, just one second here. Why Ayurveda is so personalized, right? I don't want to get into those woozy woozy thing of telling Ayurveda is Indian, it is old, therefore it is good. As a science, how is it practiced today in clinical establishments which are insurance approved, CGH is approved and all the major uh, organizations you know, supported for treatment of their own employees. So look at 11% HbA1c to 5.7% HbA1c. These three changes, right, which in modern medicine would be extremely difficult to achieve. How is that done? It is done through a, it's a personalized prescription 
And what I want to bring your attention to all these three people, if they were to go today to a modern medicine doctor, and I have the highest respect for modern medicine doctors, I'm only contrasting for the sake of telling how we can live together. But the, these three patients get three different protocols within broad protocols, right? So in the process, the pathogenesis of each of these are different. And so you reverse it in a personalized fashion, leading to completely landmark outcomes. So what we have to understand is this is, for example, for a patient of anterior horn cell disease, if we have the time, I know I have five minutes in which I will conclude. But if you look at any type of whole person health issue, this can be characterized very effectively in Ayurveda, right? With modern parameters included as well. It's also important in 2023 to look at the whole realm of integrative medicine. The classical definition after it's not very easily available is conventional or modern medicine with evidence-based complementary medicine. Currently, Ayurveda would be called complementary medicine. The patient is a central, informed, empowered patient in the participant in the care process. Body, mind, spirit level approach, community approach, natural versus strong medicines like steroids, antibiotics, and you know, surgery, where I can look at natural, more gentler medicine health promotion in addition to disease management, disease prevention. All of this is the convention, globally, the approach that is being taken because people realize all the answers do not lie in one system of medicine. This is what is happening today, as on today in leading quaternary care hospitals, where you look at primary patient of uh, acute stroke due to multiple aneurysms, neurosurgery takes over in stage one, then physiotherapy pulmonology comes at stage two, Stage three, Ayurveda comes in with these very focused objectives to reduce dyskinesia, improve speech, cognition, oral feed, oral feed, functional parameters to improve. Phase four, the patient is completely transferred to Ayurveda and others become physiatric, uh, others become supportive. This approach of a seamless collaborative model of healthcare, we truly believe, and you can see the outcomes which are tracked systematically, right? This, we believe, is a unique offering from India, which will show the world that systems can work together. This is in the incipient stage, not only for neurological issues, for cancer, adjuvant care, cancer palliative care, today in many of the leading hospitals in the country, where people work together from both systems of medicine, right? In nephrology, in gynecology, so on, right? So I just want to say, last two slides, uh, I have two, three more minutes. We talked about the body, and as Dr. Rama Jaisundar talked about the mind and the spirit, when you look at that, in a world which is beset with disorder, right? The fact that our ancient systems of thinking were, was very enlightened and gave a very clear definition. Those, of course, who are very familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, define the Triguna Atit as one who has gone beyond those Panchakoshas, right, into the the so-called Anandamaya Kosha or the bliss layer. But the fact is, how do I systematically do this? And we have to understand that the human being as a body, mind, spirit complex, as I began my second slide, and when you look at holistic medicine, we have to understand all of this is very well posited in a very structured, systematic way. Whether I look at yoga, where I look at the five avastas, you know, the kleshas of the, the mind, where chipta, mudha, mudha Vikshipta, Ekagra, Niruddha, the, the continuum of, of, of the mind status, as it goes, you can see how it goes from Rajas to Tamas to Rajas Tamas, then the beginning of Sattva, Sattva, and, and then Sattva, right? Or at the Ayurveda level, when I look at Vata, where, and this works bidirectionally, where an increase in Vata can lead to increase in Rajas primarily and some increase in Sattva in a minor way. Increase in Pitva, Pitta increases Sattva with a, a partial increase in Rajas and Tamas. And Kabha increases Tamas, which is the dark, the, the forces of ignorance. And sat, Rajas is the forces of passion and, you know, action driven by passion. And Sattva, the actions driven by clarity and self-awareness. So this continuum or bidirectional continuum from the physical to the mental allows us a very good pathway to combine psychotherapy, not just through conventional approaches, but through Ayurveda as well, right? Or I treat the physical symptoms as one of the senior doctors says, almost every disease today is psychosomatic, 
but there is a soma psychiatric approach also that ayurveda presents these are all extremely exciting opportunities for researchers to delve into india can lead this for the world and the fact i just show this because how enlightened our ancestors were when i look at the satvarajas tamas and look at the satvik satva kaya the seven types a person who is prosperous large family and the head of the village commun community is called a kubera kaya right so it is not just a rishi kaya or a brahma kaya even a kubera kaya gandharva kaya person can be satvik so in a very enlightened way people realize that human beings can be of multiple types right but they can achieve self actualization and in that process achieve as uh, dr shashi prabha told in her opening remarks the fourfold path purusharthas right and ayurveda is the means to that to that achievement of the purusharthas right in particular moksha along with the other gyana uh, the systems which are already there so i conclude uh, my presentation my allotted time of 30 minutes i would uh, welcome questions from those who have heard my presentation thank you very much for the opportunity thank you so much dr rajiv vasudevan ji your presentation was very very lucid and well argued with the help of slides and you said that ayurveda is like a brahmastra in the hands of indians very well said because this is the unique contribution of indian life system which includes the foundations of our traditional wisdom and the scientific outlook of the modern medicine now the presentation is open for queries comments or questions please I think Dr. Arvind Gupta has put up his hand. Yeah, please, Dr. Arvind Gupta. Dr. Thank Arvind you. Gupta. Thank you very much uh, for those two brilliant uh, presentations, and uh, it's really uh, been very enlightening to listen to uh, both of them. And it's very interesting that uh, both of them, uh, uh, their background is uh, in modern sciences. One is in physics, which happens to be my background as well. And I think Rajiv ji is an engineer, if I'm not uh, mistaken. That's true. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very positive trend that uh, the, those who are trained in uh, uh, modern science are beginning to realize its limitations and are looking at uh, uh, you know, our ancient uh, wisdom. So all this is very good, and I hope that this uh, trend uh, catches up. And I think that is uh, one of the reasons for uh, holding such uh, conferences. But I have uh, a couple of uh, questions. Yes, please. One is, how do we do it? You see, it's all very nice to say at a philosophical it level, at a scholarly level, but uh, at a practical level, how do we do it? Now we have a, perhaps there is a chance we have a new education policy. I do not know how this new education policy is applying, uh, applies itself to uh, the health sciences because uh, uh, in, uh, you know, our MBBS and uh, the basic uh, courses uh, where our doctors and practitioners are produced, uh, whether uh, they are aware of all that uh, has been uh, said and whether they should be made aware of uh, all this. You know, that's why I was saying that uh, the allopathic, which is the dominant uh, uh, medicine system, and everybody is, uh, you know, uh, majority of them are uh, forced to go there uh, one way or the other because there are not enough health centers or welfare, well, uh, wellness centers. So, uh, so one is to uh, tackle it at the educational level, whether our courses can be so designed that uh, what you both said uh, can be taught there and then accepted, not just taught and accepted, uh, that is one. The second is, uh, uh, which is also connected uh, question, that uh, 
how do we train uh, these people and uh, train and uh, so that uh, the, you know the quality of training the quality of uh, practice uh, that uh, uh, is uh, that is brought to a certain level that people have confidence uh, in this uh, i do not know what is the answer to that uh, those who are uh, yeah and i just one more uh, uh, just one observation uh, which is uh, uh, related to a, a remark of uh, Dr. V.K. Paul that I had read uh, uh, some time ago. I think he was speaking in one of the E20 conferences where he talked about uh, bringing Ayurveda into the medical value travel or medical uh, you know, tourism that we popularly call. So whether these practices, because we have to make it global and it has to be accepted globally so that will require a lot of effort in terms of quality in terms of pricing in terms of uh, you know standards and so on and so forth so there's a lot of work that needs to be done yeah thank you yeah. may i respond then uh, dr gupta first of all i would like to thank you and commend you for your comments in your in your speech where you articulated the need for very clear action at this point not leaving it because in subsequent uh, you know, editions of the G20 uh, collaborative uh, movement, it may not find uh, mention. So the need to create a platform for holistic health in which Ayurveda and yoga are firmly placed. Uh, I uh, want to, you know, reiterate that. I hope uh, we don't miss that uh, as one of the outcomes, number one. Number two, to your specific question, how do you practicalize it? I think uh, what we see today is over 40,000, I don't, don't want to state a much bigger number, 40,000 doctors pass out every year uh, from coming out from a neat system where they compete along with MBBS doctors. Many of them get marks almost in some cases in Madhya Pradesh, I know people who are get, getting better marks than the, the, the lowest entry mark for MBBS are still opting to go for Ayurveda, right? So there are very good quality Ayurveda scholars who are coming into the system, number one. The NCISM gives out a very structured curriculum and uh, for uh, training these doctors. The key part I want to tell in terms of practically making this ancient science into a contemporary health system. Today, if you were to look at it, all the major insurance companies, IRDA's uh, notifications from 2020, from 2016 and 2020, and in 2020, it made it mandatory all health insurance policies issued will cover Ayurveda, right? It's a huge step. So what it does is inpatient medical care for serious medical diseases now covered uh, happening. The moment the payer comes into the system, you have the growth of the science. The third part is an uh, active research activity which has started not only in uh, NG, non-governmental organizations and governmental uh, research organizations like the CCRAS, but also in private bodies. And the most encouraging thing is modern medicine hospitals like Apollo Hospitals, Medanta, Aster, and then if you take Amrita, all of them who are the top names in the country are now inbuilt, apart from the AIMS, which now have integrated medicine centers uh, in, ensconced within. You also have this thing that all the the major hospital brands are moving into Ayurveda, and of course, yoga has now become ubiquitous. So I want to say that the start has been made, but it has to be strengthened. But most important, that think tanks like the BIF, like the IIAS, needs to step up outside the boundary of stereotypes. All well-meaning, but I believe there is a need to step out of those stereotypes about Ayurveda, go and actually see what it is. I wish I had the time, if I take you through medical records, you'll see how evolved a knowledge system Ayurveda is. It is not this Nadi business and you know all the hocus pocus myth, mystical stuff built around Ayurveda. It is a very mature knowledge system. I just want to repeat that. I just invite all the scholars and esteemed uh, thinkers here to go and acquaint themselves deeper with Ayurveda. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Professor Anand Kumar. Yeah. And sorry, mm -hmm. just one more point. The point on the medical value travel, you hit upon a very important point. The, uh, the Prime Minister has articulated the need for a Heal in India, you know, initiative, which was supposed to make India a healthcare destination. And in that specific context, I, context, I reiterate why Ayurveda is a Brahmastra. Today, we attract people from low-income countries to India. We don't attract patients from OECD countries to India. The bulk of the tourists who come to India, the data shows I not put it here, 
that almost 30 to 40 percent of the people who come to Kerala of the one and a half million tourists who visit a year come keeping Ayurveda in mind, similarly to Rajasthan. So the developed country nations, their citizens come to India keeping Ayurveda and yoga in mind. The poorer countries send people for other health care. The moment we bring integrative health care, Ayurveda appropriately integrated for rehabilitation, rejuvenation care, etc., promotive health, the world will come to a doorstep. And it's one of the most potent pathways for India to position itself in the global healthcare system. I hope Thank that you. Dr. Yeah. yeah, Professor Anand Kumar. It's not working here. Anyway, <clears throat> I, I think I'm loud enough. Yes, you know, sir. but on to Mr. Gupta, uh, I, I, I like to po point out first thing is to create job opportunities for Ayurvedic graduates, which are not very lucrative and not everywhere. So in case you create more job opportunities, uh, I'm sure you will get larger number of people there and you will have good uh, manpower to deal, deal with it. And the second thing is how to spread it. The best is Patanjali model. In Patanjali, you know, they have, you know, shops in every city and in the shop, they will not give you medicine unless you go to a doctor who's sitting there, Ayurvedic doctor. So they are in almost every town and city and one can learn from them how to spread Ayurveda everywhere. One can collaborate with them and they have done in a very simple manner, I think with least investment. They have not made much investment in that. And the third thing is about training of Ayurvedic doctors. I think Ayush will have to formulate a good policy and uh, it should, you know, I should be uh, concerned with that. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments, please? Uh, if I can, I'm sorry, yes. connection, please. this thing I'll just answer in a minute. Professor Anand Kumar, you put on an extremely important point, the point of job opportunities in Ayurveda. So with the insurance sector opening up, a lot more job opportunities in Ayurveda hospitals have opened up. But what has been missing is that the Ayushman Bharat, Pradhan Mantri Jana Arogya Yojana, right, ABPMJAY, currently does not cover Ayurveda. The moment that opens up, Professor Anand Kumar, you're going to find that the job opportunities will explode. Because today, uh, the payer system is not connected. But in the last two or three years, the railways is supporting Ayurveda. You have the defense who has come in to support. You have ISRO, Department of Atomic Energy, ESIC, Employee State Insurance Corporations. All these parties are coming to allow Ayurveda, which creates healthcare facilities to be created. That's number one. I would like to say, along with the Patanjali model, while it does, I think what is very important to set up more chikitsalayas or hospitals and clinics which are proper systems driven and protocols driven. And, you know, that's we need to bring in a, a very contemporary, robust science of Ayurveda service delivery uh, to make this grow. But thank you for bringing up the point of job creation as being central. Thank you so much. Any other comment? On query. I think there's no further question of query, but I'm thankful to both the speakers in this session, Professor Rama Jaisundar and Dr. Rajiv Vasudevanji, for very effective and very strong case for Ayurveda. And two points have come up that we need integrated healthcare or collaborative model of healthcare. Not only Ayurveda, but Ayurveda with allopathy and with modern science of medicine. Both of you may have presented this viewpoint and also the background that both of you have, one from the physics background and the other. I don't see any of Ayurveda degrees in your Bhavadeta, Dr. Rajiv Vasudevan. I was amazed. At least she had a degree in Ayurveda. Rather than having MBBS, she chose BAMS. And I think that was a very right decision to take because with the blend of science and background and with the science of Ayurveda, both of them, when they integrate and when they complement each other, that will create wonders. 
So I thank you both from the core of my heart for making these presentations. And I am sure this will generate further interest in the propagation of Ayurveda. I thank Professor Anand Kumar and Dr. Arvind Gupta for their interventions, which will also benefit the propagation and furtherance of the case of Ayurveda. And in this case, two suggestions have come. One is that Ayushman Bharat scheme should cover Ayurveda. We can make yes. a suggestion from this conference. And the second is that more jobs should be created. And as you said, once it is covered under Ayushman Bharat, many more jobs will be created automatically. But how to include it in yes. our curriculum? I think these are the basics of healthcare which need to be taught to young students from the very beginning. So basics of health care should also be included in our syllabi. Yes, the courses should be designed in such a way that very basic, very simple and easy concepts of these lifestyle habits, food habits like these can be included. So I thank you both. I thank all the participants who have joined in and all the members of audience sitting in this room. We now Break for lunch. One more, one more, hello, one yeah. more comment I'd like to make, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is a real problem with Ayurvedic research. And uh, I tell you that uh, the research has become very difficult because I tried to do research with certain Ayurvedic drugs and I was not given permission by the ethics committee. So ethics committee completely follows the Western norms whatever is given in the you know whatever they do in the west they try. although our system is established over thousands of years and many of these regulations of ethics committee should not apply there because they they have never considered our indigenous system of medicine so once a person in modern medicine wants to do any kind of research like i tell you that uh, uh, i maharshi ayurveda once approached me to uh, to do a trial and test uh, a medicine that they have prepared, which they claimed that that reduces the blood sugar level, and I tried to very hard. I tried it very hard, and they said no. The some jamun seeds are present, and as you yourself have mentioned, that they reduce the blood sugar level. If the patient dies, what will happen? So they, they said, you know, we cannot allow you first do all animal research and prove the efficacy, yes. and only we can. So ethics committee is also a big barrier. The ethics committee of the modern hospitals. Yes, please. And the scientific centers. Thank you. So the ethical Thank you. consideration should should also be, you know, again relooked for Ayurvedic research. Thank you. You have made your point. Any, any hmm. questions from the speakers, please, if you want to respond. No, quickly, just to say that I'm sure Professor Rama would also have to add, but I would say that uh, in the clinic, in the integrative centers we are working with now, we're very pleased to tell that the ethics committees are very proactive and open. So increasingly, we're seeing that we have two clinical trials on cancer palliative care, adjuvant care and palliative care uh, in head and neck surgeries with the, uh, where things are working together. So, but they, of course, demand in Bangalore, in one of the main hospitals we're working here, and we see openness and willingness to look at it. Of course, they study all the data and the, pro the robustness of the protocol. But I completely sympathize with what Professor Anand Kumar says that we have challenges of the kind that he says. But this is a journey and we have to keep on that path. Thank you. Dr. Rama, would you like to? Please unmute yourself. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so I agree with the, what uh, uh, Professor Anand Kumar said. In majority of the modern allopathic hospitals, the ethics committee is a barrier. So it's very, very difficult to uh, get ethical clearance for uh, studies, you know, where Ayurveda is used as a standalone, uh, uh, you know, system. And, you know, unless uh, one proves uh, provides evidence of Ayurveda as a standalone system, it will always be made to play a second fiddle uh, to modern system. 
So the fundamental philosophy is being very different. We should uh, uh, kind of provide evidence as uh, as to what Ayurveda can do, uh, you know, uh, on its using its own parameters. So I think uh, there's a lot of uh, changes that needs to be brought in. Uh, the way the ethical committees, ethics committees looks at these studies. Definitely, you know, uh, I agree with Professor Anand Kumar that could be isolated uh, integrative centers where things are more streamlined. But in majority of the cases, it's very difficult to uh, do conduct these studies. Yeah, so I think, you know, this is a very, very important point that uh, Professor Anand Kumar has made and this need to be looked into. And I think one of the major problem is the ignorance of what uh, the system is. People do not understand. People, uh, because the Ayurveda is about 5,000 or 6,000 years old, people believe that it cannot be scientific. Uh, people associate technology with something being scientific. People should understand what science is. I mean, there are, uh, uh, there is mathematics, there is theoretical physics, chemistry, where no technology is required. Right? Uh, but they are all hardcore sciences. So, you know, people should understand what science is and the science behind Ayurveda. And I think this knowledge is very, very important to be disseminated. So, if people are able to appreciate, see the logic and rational behind the Ayurvedic uh, practice, uh, then I think uh, it can also pave the way for, you know, making things a bit more easier. Thank you so much. Before we, Dr. Bhavna Parashar. Uh, hi, uh, a wonderful discussion going around. I could not resist myself from adding another point uh, beyond ethics uh, after that, you know, because uh, when we are asked about the evidence, evidence in the form of publication or a report, and again, there a bias comes in regarding accepting the papers with the standalone therapy uh, in in the in the form of publication so i think because the discussion was becoming very comprehensive i thought of adding that last last mile uh, hurdle which also happens because evidence uh, means publication of the results and publication demands acceptance by journals again there the conventional uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, people domain, uh, dominate and uh, standalone, like I can, I, I can say that even the standalone COVID therapies uh, that we gave and uh, the kind of publications, we had to struggle to get them reviewed also. So that's another point just wanted to add for the sake of completion of the discussion. It's a very, Thanks. very valid point. Very valid point, Bhavna. Thank you so much. May I request both the speakers in this session? I hope you have already submitted your papers. Dr. Rajiv Vasudevan said he has already forwarded it to Rohit. Ramaji, you have also yes. forwarded it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again. And we look forward to the next session after lunch at 1.35. So it's lunchtime that we have opened the use of. Dr. Bhavna Parashar Hassan will be the next speaker and she will be speaking on Ayurveda for humanity, person-centric. Her topic is proactive and personalized approach of Ayurveda towards health and medicine. Second speaker will be Dr. Prasad M. And he will be talking about person-centric approach in Ayurveda, a glimpse of Charaka Samhita. So we look forward to meeting you all after lunch, a very brief break. So have lunch as Ayurveda says, mita, mitashi, matrashi, atava mita book. So have kita book, mita book, and rita book. Thank you. While I introduce Dr. Rama Jaisundar, she's professor and head department of NMR and MRI. All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She has a unique and unusual career trajectory. A PhD in Physics from University of Cambridge, UK. She also holds a professional medical degree in Ayurveda. While pioneering biomedical MR work in India, she enrolled for the 51 upon 2 years undergraduate medical degree as a full-time student at the age of 41. Despite securing admission for MBBS, 
She opted for a medical degree in Ayurveda, BAMS. She is the only one at both the national and international levels to hold dual degrees in physics and Ayurveda. As an MR scientist, her area of specialization is biomedical NMR, clinical imaging and spectroscopy, neuroscience applications of MR, radio frequency, coil designing and building, and RF pulse sequence programming, to name a few. She has wide experience in both experimental and clinical MRI and spectroscopy. Her indigenously developed low-cost RF coils for clinical MR scanners costing less than 5% of that of the manufacturers had won her Young Scientist Award. During her stint as a visiting professor at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry, Göttingen, Germany, she worked on functional MRS techniques. She has a number of research publications, awards and honors to her credit, using her dual qualification as an MR physicist and a professionally qualified Ayurvedic doctor, she is currently involved in scientific exploration of Ayurveda. Her current research interests harness her distinctive training in experimental MR, physics, Ayurveda and modern medicine for innovative work in Ayurveda and its concepts, methods, pharmacology and clinical practices using NMR, MRI and a number of analytical techniques. She is also actively engaged in dissemination of knowledge of the scientific rationale behind Ayurveda and is currently one of the most erudite, articulate and widely traveled ambassadors of Ayurveda. We welcome you Dr. Rama Jayasundar and now the floor is for you. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, please, we can. Yeah, and can you see this? Uh, see my slides as well? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and my very deep pronouns to the highly respected dignitaries and speakers and participants. And my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to share some of my thoughts on Ayurveda uh, and the holistic and its holistic nature. Now, for uh, over uh, quite a few decades, uh, the conventional system of medicine, that is the allopathic system of medicine, has focused on diseases, the, it, their pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment. So that has been the conventional uh, uh, interest and focus of the, the modern system of medicine. But in recent times, there is an increasing interest and realization that uh, of the importance of preventive and promotive health. So it is now realizing that that our health is very uh, complex and that there are layers of uh, health. So there is a physical health, there is a physiological health, there is a psychological health, emotional health, interpersonal health, social health, environmental health, and ecological health. All these contribute uh, to not only the health of the individual, but health of our ecosystem as well. Now, because of this, uh, uh, increasing uh, realization and understanding. There is much interest in holistic health, holistic well-being, and holistic health care. So, holistic uh, health is uh, considers the multi-dimensional aspects of wellness: the physical, physiological, mental, emotional, so social, and even spiritual. This has been highlighted by all the speakers uh, who have speak spoken before me. Now, this is a theoretical wish list. Right? So this is pretty theoretical, but to convert this onto a pragmatic platform, we need a model. A model which factors in the different dimensions of existence and different layers of health. Now, before I go on to the model uh, adopted by Ayurveda, 
for its management and understanding and management of health and well-being. Uh, let me uh, quickly, uh, you know, refresh your memories about the current model. Uh, why the current model? Because it's a predominantly prevalent system of medicine uh, across the globe, and it's a model that we are quite familiar with. So this conventional medicine, the model has that has been adopted by it has a focus on structure. We all know that everything physical in the world, including the human system, we are also physical entities. Uh, it's made up of atom. So atom is the fundamental building block of everything physical in the world. So as far as the biology is, biological system is concerned, you have atoms which make molecules, then you have organelles, cells, tissues, organ, organ system, and the entire organism. So, as one moves up the structural hierarchy, there are increasing levels of complexities which emerges. So, the entire organism uh, can be reduced to the level of the fundamental building block, if not atom, definitely uh, to the level of molecule for its understanding and management of the biological system. In fact, modern medicine is also called a molecular medicine because it understands uh, uh, especially the disease processes at the level of molecule. And because the entire organism uh, is reduced to the level of fundamental or uh, functional units, it is also called a reductionistic standpoint. Now, in this structural hierarchical model, mind is not factored in. Now, let me explain why mind is not factored in. For that, let us go uh, to this uh, uh, as to how uh, a model for a human system is conceptualized. So whether whatever system of medicine, you either manage uh, the, the health or you give a treatment. Now, these are dependent on the indices, metrics that are used for assessing health or the metrics used for diagnosing disease. So the treatment or management is defined by the assessment and diagnostic metrics and this in turn is defined by the model. The model refers to how the human system has been conceptualized and understood. So if going by the uh, previous slide, if the model uh, is uh, uses the focuses on structures and structural entities, then the assessment and diagnostic metrics will use the same parameters as well. So either a gross structure, cells, organs, tissues, or biochemical entities, which are also structural entities. The human system is such a complex system that there is more than one way of looking at it. And the way one looks at it, the standpoint is defined by worldview of the contributing sciences. As far as the modern medicine is concerned, the contributing basic sciences are uh, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. So it is the worldview which allows one to look at the physical reality, physical and non-physical reality around them, which decides how the human system or a biological system is also going to be understood. So the worldview actually decides the model. The model decides the metrics used for assessment or diagnosis, and this defines the management or the treatment. So uh, the current model, is based on the worldview of classical physics, uh, where there is a conceptual separation between mind and matter. So this is a inherent uh, 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 fundamental philosophy of classical physics, where mind and matter are considered as two separate entities. Now, because of this, mind is not factored in, in this structural hierarchical model. Now, let us see what kind of model Ayurveda has adopted. So Ayurveda also uses the the, the same uh, you know um, process is followed for any medical system. So you have the management which is dependent on the metrics used, and this is dependent on how the human system is understood, and this in turn is dependent on the world. So what is the world view of Ayurveda? So the world view of Ayurveda is based on the Vedic worldview. In fact, it is the worldview of Vedanta or Uttara Mimamsa, which has uh, been used by Ayurveda to conceptualize the human system. So in this Vedic worldview, there is a conceptual inseparability of mind and matter. All the Vedic sciences 
consider mind and matter as one cohesive unit. They cannot be separated at all. So this is in stark contrast to the worldview of the classical physics. So the Vedic worldview talks of interconnectedness. It says that nature exists as a continuum and the universe is a web of interconnected entities in a dynamic relationship. So this is the worldview of uh, uh, Ayurveda. So based on this worldview, Ayurveda has conceptualized the human system. So just as uh, uh, you know, modern medicine has conceptualized the human system based on the worldview of classical physics, Ayurveda has conceptualized the human system based on the Vedic worldview, which talks of interconnectedness of everything in nature. So this one can call a four domains model. So there is a structural domain that Ayurveda talks about. So this is network. This is actually a network of channels. So the channels are called shrotas in Ayurveda. In fact, one of the definition for the human body is shrotomaya, which means that the body is nothing but, uh, you know, uh, but a uh, network of channels. So the channels will re uh, refer to indicate uh, blood vessels or, or, you know, nerves and lymphatic vessels and so on. Anything that that's a channel that connects the structures, it's uh, it's con it's uh, considered in this structural domain. So this is a intra-connected uh, domain. Then there is a physiological domain that Ayurveda talks about, and this is defined by parameters uh, called vata, pitta, and kapha. For convenience, I have referred to this as VP and K. And you can see that the structural and the physiological domain is connected, interconnected using these parameters defined by V and K. Then there is a third domain, which is the mind or the psychological domain. And this again is a network of psychological parameters. But again, you see the connect between the psychological domain and the physiological domain through the parameters defined by VP and K. And then there is a fourth domain, which is the subtlest aspect of human existence consciousness. And this is connected through what are called levels of awareness. These are called panchakoshas. This is uh, dealt with in much greater detail uh, in yoga. So, and so the psychological domain and the domain of consciousness is connected again to the psychological parameters. But what is very interesting is that the subtlest aspect of human existence, that is the consciousness domain, is connected to the gross physical structural domain through the first level of awareness. So the first level of awareness for any body should be the physical body. We all know that a dead person is not aware of his or her physical body. So the first level of awareness is the physical body. And the uh, subtlest domain of consciousness is connected to the structural domain through the first level of awareness. So you see how the four domains, the structural, physiological, psychological, and the domain of consciousness are interconnected within itself. And they are also interconnected. There are parameters which connect these four domains. So the, so the conceptualization of human system uh, based on the Vedic worldview is, gives a seamless integrated whole where we are seamlessly mind, body, and soul in Ayurveda. So these are never uh, viewed uh, in isolation in Ayurveda, be it the understanding of health and disease or management of health and disease. Now, let us look at this in uh, slightly more detail uh, to see how they have been used at a pragmatic level, how they have been used for practical purposes. See, you can have any amount of, any number of conceptualization and theoretical visualization. visualization. But the fact is whether, uh, the interesting thing is whether they are translated onto a practical platform where the management can be done. So Ayurveda classifies the human system uh, uh, into two, uh, into gross and subtle aspects. And then there is a structure-based classification which deals with the physical aspect of human existence. Then there is a function-based classification which deals with physiological and psychological. Of course, when I say physiological, physical is also uh, uh, included in it, uh, factor in because there is no physiological functions without the physical entities, structural entities. 
Then there is a system based classification, which deals with physical, physiological, and psychological. So, this system based classification is not the same as the uh, system based classification in modern medicine. Modern medicine talks about reproductive system, digestive system, central nervous system, and so on. So, this system based classification is not exactly the same. This talks about uh, strothus. So, there are group of channels which are grouped together and which contribute to a particular function. So that is the system-based classification in Ayurveda. The subtle aspect uh, which deals with levels of awareness deals with the psychological uh, and other real, uh, subtle realms of awareness. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of these various uh, subclassifications, but I would like to give a peek into this functional classification for two reasons. So this will uh, give an idea as to how these other uh, subclassifications are dealt with. And the second more, a more important factor is that this functional classification and understanding runs as an undercurrent to the entire understanding and management of health and disease in Ayurveda. So uh, the function Ayurveda has identified three functions, which it considers very important for the basic functioning of the system. That is movement, metabolism and transformation and growth. Now in the context of Ayurveda, these are called Vata, Vita and Kapha, which I already mentioned. I will indicate as B, P and K for convenience. So B, P and K, are characterized by parameters which are biophysical, chemical, physiological, and psychological in nature. So all the psychophysiological functions of the human system come under this classification of BP and K. You cannot find any psychophysiological functions which comes outside the purview of the classification of BP and K. So BP and K actually is the framework, theoretical framework that Ayurveda has for understanding and management of health and disease. So this is a, this is an example of some of the parameters. You can see that whatever is comes under the physical is actually they are actually biophysical parameters. For example, dryness, fluidity, adhesivity, size, stiffness, viscosity, weight, elasticity, roughness. All these are biophysical properties, and uh, these come either under water or pitta or kapha. And the chemical parameter is pH. Of course, Ayurveda does not use the term pH. It uses the word acidity. So the uh, logical inference is that it indicates pH. Uh, the physiological parameter is temperature. And you can see some of the psychological parameters I have mentioned here. Creativity, anxiety, confidence, leadership, quality. These are all properties, metrics that we can relate to. And these are more, which I have not uh, shown in the slide for want of space. All these come under either Vata or Pitta or Kapha. So Vata, Pitta and Kapha are functions with parameters which impact these functions. Okay? So that is the uh, classification of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. So this shows and all these parameters are connected with each other. So you see that the worldview adopted by Ayurveda is interconnectivity. So there is nothing that sits in isolation. Uh, there are no metrics which are uh, isolated in Ayurveda. So this shows the uh, properties. These are predominantly biophysical, chemical, and physiological properties. So V1 to V7 are properties which uh, comes under Vata. P1 to P7 are metrics which comes under Pitta and K1 to K7 under Kapha. So you see how these uh, uh, properties or metrics are connected with each other. And when this is in balance, it denotes health. And disease is a system perturbation in Ayurveda. So the job of the Ayurvedic doctor, Vaidya, is to get this network back into balance. So when you have a, a, a very complex system like the human system, there are two things that can be done. One is that you can uh, get information about all these individual components or metrics, or you understand the network, how these are connected, and you try to manage them. What Ayurveda does is managing these connectivities. And so this is, of course, a model. 
and uh, our ancestors have uh, used a very very ingenious very very interesting way to uh, convert it uh, to a practical uh, as a practical model workable model so since the uh, human system is understood in terms of BP and K. They have brought onto the platform of BPK all factors which impact health and disease. So, for example, medicinal plants, metals and minerals and animals, these are used for preparing medicines. So, all these are classified in terms of BP and K. Animals and food, these are part of our diet. These are again classified in terms of BPK. And the environment seasons are also classified in terms of BPK. And this classification helps the Vaidya strategize the treatment. And lifestyle activities, whether we sit or lie down or cycle or swim or run or jog or jump, all these are again classified into as under BP and K. So the clinical symptoms are also classified uh, under VPK. So one small example. Uh, let us take the very simple example of common cold. If the nasal discharge is watery and thin, then it is a vata related cold. If the nasal discharge is slightly mucus and yellow in color and comes out with a burning sensation, then it is a pitta related cold. If the nasal discharge is white, mucus thick, then it is kapha associated cold. So all the clinical symptoms, it could be symptoms, uh, uh, you know, associated with COVID or uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or any autoimmune disease, it does not matter. All the symptoms come under uh, BP and K. So once the clinical symptoms are presented to the Vaidya, the Vaidya makes the diagnosis. So whether it is a Vata related symptom or a Pitta related or a Kapha related or a combination, it could be a Vata Pitta or a Pitta Kapha or a Vata Kapha or a combination of all three. Once the diagnosis is made, then the treatment is strategy. So for example, um, if it is a vata associated symptom, if it's a vata vyadi, then uh, medicinal plants are, or metals and minerals or animal products uh, which reduce vata are used to make medicines and animals and food and ingredients, you know, which reduce vata are prescribed as a diet and whichever increases vata have to be avoided. Lifestyle activities which decrease vata uh, are to be followed. The ones which increase vata uh, should not be uh, uh, should be avoided, and the seasons. If it is a vata aggravating season or a pitta aggravating season or a vata reducing season, that is taken into account to actually strategize the entire uh, therapeutic program. So VPK is uh, has been very cleverly made as a common interface so that. Uh, all factors which impact health and disease can speak the same language and can be used in an easy and intelligent way. So, in fact, VPK is a common platform for not only, uh, you know, metrics within the humans, but also for animals. Animals also have the same framework of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Animals are also classified in terms of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Uh, the, the, uh, the person was talking about uh, uh, Mriga Ayurveda and Briksha Ayurveda. The same framework which is used for humans has been used for animals and plants. So all these, the three humans, animals and plants are living beings, non-living beings, you know, uh, like the environment which consists of soil. Soils have been classified in terms of BPK. Water has been classified in terms of BP and K. Seasons have been classified in terms of BP and K. So VPK is the framework that binds, that brings together all the biological and the non-biological, uh, uh, you know, entities in the ecosystem. So we have seen, I showed you, uh, you know, gave you a glimpse of how the functional classification defined by Vata, Pitta and Kapha uh, uh, is used for management and understanding of health and disease. Now let us uh, very quickly look at uh, uh, the subtle aspect of human existence because here we see the connect between the physical and the non-physical uh, aspects of human existence. So this, as I said, is uh, 
discussed in detail uh, in the Panchakosha theory. So uh, you all maybe may have heard of these Panchakoshas, the Annamaya, the Pranamaya Kosha, Manomaya, Vijnanamaya, and Manandamaya Kosha. So the subtle body is seen in five dimensions, uh, and these are interconnected levels of uh, awareness. So these are, uh, while there are no hierarchy, there's no hierarchy in the uh, functional classification, uh, here, in this subtle aspect of human existence, there is a hierarchical level of awareness where one goes from gross to the subtle. So the outermost periphery is the physical body, that is the Annamaya Kosha. And so Anna means referred, Mayo means personification. So we are personification of food. So our physical body is defined by the food that we take. So the outermost periphery, that is the physical body, it refers to the mechanics of how a human being is built. So the physical body is very gross. We can see it, we can feel it. The Pranamaya Kosha, which is the energy sheath, is subtler. And the Manomaya Kosha, uh, that is the mental sheath, is even more subtle. So you have the Annamaya, Pranamaya, and Manomaya. All these are physical entities, physical aspects. So we can try and understand this with a very crude analogy of a light bulb. So uh, the light bulb is physical. This is physical. The wire that connects the bulb to the socket is also physical. The electricity that runs through this frontal socket is also physical. And we know that electricity is nothing but the flow of electrons. So electrons are also physical, right? Except that these two are gross, we can see. And these two physical entities cannot be seen with naked eye. So the physical yeah, and, uh, energy and mental bodies, sheets, are all physical dimensions of us. So the fourth dimension uh, is the Vigyanamaya Kosha. It is the non-physical uh, uh, aspect, but it is related to the physical aspect. So one can consider this as a transit state. Then you have, so that is a Vigyanamaya Kosha. The fifth dimension is the Anandamaya Kosha. It is completely non-physical. It is actually the body, the physical body, which holds or houses this Anandamaya Kosha. And when, when the body is taken off, this fifth non-physical dimension becomes part of the cosmos. So you see how the physical entity is connected to the non-physical aspect of you in the human and how this non-physical aspect can make a direct connection with the cosmos when the physical body is taken off or even through yoga and meditation, this connect can be made. So Ayurveda, in fact, very beautifully says that from the core of our being to the vast expanse of the universe, we exist as one. The whole universe is the expansion of one's consciousness. So you see how in one sweep, grand sweep, the uh, physical and non-physical realities are connected. And this is because of the worldview that Ayurveda has adopted, which talks about interconnectivity. So the connectedness extends far beyond the individual reaching into the universe. So because of this understanding of health in a holistic way or understanding the interconnections, the management is also holistic. There are physical interventions in terms of medicines, procedures called panchakarmas and diet. And then there are non-physical, non-pharmacological interventions to deal with the non-physical aspect of human existence. So like yoga, meditation, chanting of mantras, all these comes under non-pharmacological interventions. So health is multidimensional in Ayurveda. So a lifestyle, sleep and food plays a very, very important role in health. And Ayurveda, of course, talks about physical health, physiological health, psychological health, environmental health, societal health, and the sensorial health. How to use our senses in a healthy way so that uh, we maintain our well-being and wellness. And uh, health is multi-parametric in Ayurveda because of the complexity, because of the multi-dimensional aspects which have been factored in. So VPK, uh, the phenotypes, the prakriti, not only the physical and the physiological prakriti, but the manasika psychological prakriti, manasika prakriti, the season, that is the circa annual rhythm, time of the day, the circadian rhythm, 
lifestyle activities, age, gender, food, occupation, environment, digestive capacity, all these are various parameters that are used not only to understand health, but also to manage health. The same parameters are used for understanding and management of diseases as well. So health is multi, uh, it's a multimodal delivery in Ayurveda. So there are general rules uh, what everybody should do or should not do. For example, everybody should sleep in the night is a general rule for everybody. Then there are regional rules which uh, takes into account uh, the, the climatic condition, the environment, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the, the ecology of the region. There are family traditions uh, and there are festivals, you know, the, there are different cuisines and the activities involved associated with different festivals. So these actually factor in, in uh, healthy uh, celebrations and uh, it also syncs with the season of the uh, season in which the festival takes place. So then there are age dependent regimens, phenotype, pregnancy dependent regimens, occupation dependent regimens, seasonal regimens, and so on. So Ayurveda, the science of life, uses the concept of interconnectedness and relationship to define and understand uh, uh, its uh, the well-being. And this is in contrast to the concept of uh, discreteness, uh, which has been used by conventional medicine. So it's interesting that two different worldviews, one talking of material entities and discreteness, and the other talking, talking of the interconnectivity, has given rise to two different models of human system. And uh, so it will be very interesting to combine the best of both uh, to come up with one world, one health. So let me uh, stop here and I thank uh, the organizers once again for giving me this wonderful platform to share some of my thoughts on uh, how Ayurveda handles uh, health or how Ayurveda understands and manages health in a holistic way. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman, for such a lovely presentation. I think there will be many queries and questions. So it is open for questions, please. Ten minutes of question answer. Any comments, questions? Professor Anand Kumar. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm very, very happy to, to see you, Rama, here. And I'm really very proud the way you have presented your uh, lecture. It is really, uh, although I worked in some medicines in Ayurveda, and, uh, uh, but uh, I have never thought of Ayurveda in this way. And uh, I'm really, you know, I feel very envious having heard you. And now I know the various kind of complications, why a drug response, because we generally, in the allopathic system, we generally, you know, uh, irrespective of uh, uh, these considerations, give a drug, administer a drug, and then we find in some people it responds, in the other people it is resistant, and then we try another drug, so it is hit and run. But now I really understand that how, what way, what pitta and kapha, they are important in deciding perhaps even in allopathic medicine and uh, even allopathic medicines can be looked at uh, from this paradigm and uh, you know there are various kind of medicines are available for one disease, for one simple thing. So you know if we know that which will respond by knowing the what keep uh, pitta and kapha composition or you know uh, constitution of that person we can avoid hit and run and you know hit sorry not hit and run but hit and trial you know <laughs> hit and trial and uh, we can be very specific in administering the drug and uh, get a response thank you very much so thank you so much so in fact ayurveda has a 
uh, a working you know a framework uh, which can give the paradigm shift that uh, uh, modern medicine is also looking about there would be many many take home messages for uh, the uh, modern system of medicine from ayurveda thank you so much any other question professor singh you have a question Anybody from the audience there who have joined in? I think your exposition was so clear with the help of PowerPoint presentation. It was based on the philosophical foundations of Indian tradition. What is going on? So it was very innovative and I think integrated approach. And that too, from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, it's really appreciable. Thank you so much for your enriching presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rama. Thank you very much, Mushkar. But please keep joining and you can participate in further discourse. Absolutely. I will stay connected. I will stay connected and I will. Thank you so much. Thanks again.